Good morning, everyone, and welcome. We have eight o'clock, so we're going to start. My name is Julie Sievers, and I'm a Senior Water Solutions Specialist with the ISG. And we would uh, like to welcome you. We're thrilled with the turnout. So um, a little housekeeping first. We have everyone muted. So if you have a question during the during any of the presentations this morning, feel free to type a question in the chat box and we will answer those as we go. If you have a question that you would like to answer, uh, have us answer outside the presentation, uh, you are uh, free to call us or email us and we will respond to those. If you have more than one person at the site that you're at, Please, if you would, please either enter their names in the chat box or email me. Uh, my email was in the invitation, but we need to know who is there for our attendance. So if three of you are watching from one sign-in location, um, hopefully all three of you registered so we have your ID numbers and what you want for your CUs, but you need to email us and say all three of you are, are watching at one site. So if you would please do that for where you've got multiple people at one location, we'd appreciate it. And we are recording these. So these presentations will be on the ISG YouTube channel in the near future. So if you wanna go back and review any of the topics or any of the presentations, you are welcome to do that. Uh, you cannot do that and obtain CEUs. The CEUs are only awarded for participating in the live session, um, but they will be there for your future reference. So to get us started, my name is Julie Sievers. As I said, I'm a Senior Water Solutions Specialist at ISG. I retired from the Iowa DNR after 24 years, and prior to that, I'd spent um, some time working in uh, three different, four different environmental labs in the state. So I'm going to talk about emerging topics for water systems. And we're going to start, hopefully, we're going to start talking about COVID-19. So as you know, water and wastewater operators are all classified as essential workers. So first and foremost, I would thank you for all the work that you are doing. Um, your work is very, very important as I don't need to explain to you, but we do really appreciate all that you're doing. So according to EPA and several other sources, the COVID-19 virus has not been detected in drinking water. So based on the current evidence, the risk to water supplies is low. CDC, EPA, uh, the World Health Organization, all are encouraging people to continue to use and drink water from their taps as usual. This is a message that your customers need to hear and they need to hear it continually. So any way that you can communicate that to your customer, whether it's through social media, whether it's through a newsletter, uh, just in talking with people, that's a message they need to continue to hear. So there's many resources available for you. Uh, the EPA uh, drinking water page for coronavirus is the link that's listed here. They talk about several different areas, including systems operation, laboratory capacity, funding and financing. They have a pandemic incident ch action checklist and they have other resources. So a little bit about systems operation. So if you're having an issue with your operation, we'd encourage you to contact your state DNR field office staff. They're doing a tremendous job of doing operator assistance and they are a good resource for you um, if you have immediate issues. The Water and Wastewater Agency Response Network, WARN, is a state program. It's available at no cost to join. And if your system has not joined, I would encourage you to do that. Um, you can Google Iowa Warn. Iowa Warn is IA Warn. Um, or contact uh, me and I can put you 
in contact with the right contact person. There are also circuit writer and technical assistance programs out there that are available. They vary by state. In Iowa, uh, it's Iowa Real Water, IAMU, and others. And I would tell you that you can also contact uh, your engineering or your consulting firms also for assistance. Talking a little bit about sampling. So you need to complete your sampling as required. Um, in Iowa, that means following your um, water supply operations permit. If you are finding that you cannot sample for your routine bacteria samples at the sites in your sampling plan, uh, you need to find alternative sites and document the change on your sampling plan log. You don't need to change your sampling plan, but do, do document that you change locations and you need to make sure that you are um, using sites within that same area of town that you should be sampling in regularly. If you cannot sample at your approved TTHM and HA5 location, find a nearby location and sample there. For those changes, you need to notify your DNR field office of the change, but you don't change your sampling plan. And then you need to continue uh, your self-monitoring as required. So EPA has a good checklist resource. It's called the Pandemic Incident Action Checklist. This is a checklist that um, addresses impacts to drinking water and wastewater utilities. And it may include, uh, but it's not limited to, staff shortages due to absenteeism or illness supply change disruptions, including chemicals, materials, personal <laughs> protection equipment, uh, those types of things, interruptions in field operations. So those would be repairs, meter readings, uh, sampling, and the inability to maintain all operations. This checklist is set up in uh, three sections. EPA calls them rip and run. Uh, they are actions to prepare, actions to respond, and actions to recover. And then there's a contacts and resources list. These are all available on the uh, EPA Water Utility Resources, and there's a link, I believe, from the DNR website. So one of the things that's being talked about now is recovery. So prior uh, to having businesses and large buildings open back up, the CDC is recommending a building flushing program. So they're finding that when buildings have been shut down or had much less use, the building water quality degrades and that becomes a serious issue. There is guidance um, that's been created by the CDC and it's on both the CDC and the DNR websites. Um, so you just need to Google um, guidance for building flushing and it should come right up for you. So there are a number of other resources available. As I mentioned, EPA has a drinking water website page for uh, COVID-19, the Water Information Sharing and Analysis Center, Water ISAC has a page. CDC has a good page about drinking water. Um, I, Iowa Department of Public Health and the World Health Organization as well. Switching gears to talk about America's Water Infrastructure Act, AWEA. So AWEA is a federal law. It was signed um, into effect in October of 2018. It contains many sections and section 2013 is what we're going to talk about today. So this section applies to community water systems serving more than 3,300 persons. It requires these systems to complete or update a risk and resilience assessment and complete or update their emergency response plan and then submit certifications to EPA that this has been done. So one of the things you need to be aware of is this is required of systems serving more than 3,300 persons. So if you're a system that serves consecutive systems, you need to include their population uh, in yours and get a total population served 
to determine your schedule. You're required to review and update both of these documents every five years and submit the certifications that you did that every five years. And you need to make sure that these plans include malevolent acts and natural hazards. So these are the deadlines and they're by population served and including those consecutive systems. So the largest systems, those serving 100,000 or more, theirs were already due, the risk and resilience assessments were due. They were due by March 31st. If you're a large system and not yet completed it and submitted your certification, do it as soon as possible. Systems serving 50,000 to 99,999, their risk and resilience assessments are due by December 31st of this year. And then the smallest systems, those serving 3,301 to 49,999 are due by June 30th of 2021, June 30th of next year. The emergency response plans are due no later than six months after the certification of the risk and resilience assessment. And then you have to review and update these every five years. There's been some publications out that show the deadline for your emergency response plans are six months after the due date for the risk and resilience assessment, and that is not correct. Your emergency response plan certification is no later than six months after you do your certification for your risk and resilience assessment. So what does a risk and resilience assessment include? In one, these are to evaluate your vulnerabilities, your threats, and your consequences for potential hazards. You need to review all your water facility infrastructures. So that includes your sources, um, any piping, your treatment, your storage, your distribution system, and any other infrastructure you have. You need to look at any physical barriers that you have in place. You need to look at your electrical systems. That would include your control systems and a SCADA system if you have one. You need to look at your monitoring practices. Where are, your, where are you vulnerable? What are your threats for your monitoring practices? You need to look at your financial systems, such as your billing systems. You're required to look at your chemical storage and handling systems, and then operation and maintenance as a whole. As a whole. And that includes your operator availability, your workforce. And so that's something, especially now with COVID-19, we need to take into account uh, what those kinds of threats are to your operational staff. Emergency response plans are, in, are to include strategies and resources to improve the resiliency of your system. So you need to look at both physical security and cyber security. You need to have plans and procedures for responding to natural hazards and malevolent acts. Uh, you need to have actions and equipment to lessen the impact of those, and then strategies to detect. And that's a really interesting one because how, how do you detect or how do you uh, know when something's going on in your system that's a threat to your system? So the certifications, so this is, this is the final step and this is a very important one. You do not submit your re risk and resilience assessment or your emergency response plan to EPA or to the state. What you do do is you submit a certification that you've completed each. You need to submit your certification that you have your risk and resilience assessment done by the deadline and then the certification that you have your emergency response plan within six months of that certification of your risk and resilience assessment. There's three ways to submit your certification. EPA is preferring and asking that you use their secure online portal, if at all possible, but you can email your certification or you can send it via regular mail. You need to retain both these documents um, on site and they need to be available for at least five years. So there are some tools out there. Um, EPA has developed what they're calling a vulnerability self-assessment tool, VSAT Web, for the risk and resilience assessment. And they have an emergency response plan template. 
You're not required to use those, but if you want to, they're available from the EPA website. AWWA also has a certificate program that will walk you through and explain how to do these. Um, you can complete this work yourself um, within your system or you can work with a consultant. Systems are encouraged when you're doing your emergency response plan to work with your local emergency response planning committees. And there is training available from the EPA website. So PFAS. So one of the things that we're hearing a lot about are these chemicals. And their um, PFAS stands for per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. It's pronounced PFAS. This is a group of more than 5,000 different compounds. They're found everywhere, and you're starting to hear them called forever chemicals. These are all man-made chemicals, and they've been manufactured and used since the 1940s. PFOS, or PFOS, and PFOA are the two that are the most studied and the two that you typically hear about. So where are these used and where will you find them? So one of the things you hear a lot about is AFFF, firefighting foam. They're also used as stain and water repellent coatings for textiles. So think waterproof boots, raincoats, the stain repellent on furniture and carpets. Those types of things are all PFAS chemicals. Oil and moisture resistant package, pa pa <laughs> oil and moisture resistant food packaging. So the, the coating on pizza boxes, microwave popcorn bags, fast food food wrappers, those types of things that are resistant to that oil and moisture. They're used in a number of household products. They're Teflon, your nonstick coating on pans, paints and waxes and cleaning products. They're also found in personal care products, shampoos, dental floss, and a lot of cosmetics. They're also used in metal plating and etching, in wire coating and insulation, and they have many, many other uses. So why are they a problem? Well, they bioaccumulate, which means they persist in the environment. They do not degrade under natural conditions. They dissolve in water, so they move with groundwater and precipitation. They only thermal degrade at very high temperatures. So greater than 900 C, 900 centigrade, not Fahrenheit. And there's numerous health issues at very low levels. We're talking parts per trillion levels, PPT, or nanograms per liter. So very, very low levels. They include low birth weight, low, uh, low infant birth weights, effects on the immune system. Uh, they've been shown to cause cancer. They increase cholesterol levels, their thyroid hormone disruption, and many others. So why are we talking about them and why are they issue? Well, there's been a tremendous amount of media coverage and public awareness has increased. So you, need, you as an operator need to be aware of these compounds if you get questions. There have been several reports from environmental groups um, if you want to look at one, go, go Google or search for the Environmental Working Group, e, EWG's PFAS report. There have been two documentaries that have gotten a lot of coverage, The Devil We Know and Dark Waters. And there's been a lot of publicity about DOD sampling at Air Force and Army bases and what they're finding there. So there's been some regulatory action in 2003 and, and 2015. Uh, companies voluntarily cease production. Uh, different parts of that group of compounds in those two, D, two years. In 2013 through 2015, EP included six of these compounds as part of their unregulated contaminant monitoring rule three, UCMR three. In May 2016, EPA established a health advisory of 70 parts per trillion per for PFOAS or and PFOA, both individually or as a sum of both. In February of 2019, EPA released their PFAS action plan. And then in 20, February of 2020, just a few months ago, EPA 
made a preliminary determination to regulate PFOS and PFOA in drinking water. So several states, because of the slow action by EPA, have established statewide MCLs or enforcement limits. Minnesota's been doing work on this since 2002. Iowa has developed a PFAS action plan. It was released in February of 2020. It is available on the DNR website, and Iowa's using the EPA health advisory levels for drinking water. So these compounds are all around us, so sampling analysis is very challenging. You really need to consider the objectives if you're thinking about doing sampling. You need to answer these questions. Why are you sampling? What do you want to learn? Which compounds are you going to include in the testing? Which method are you going to use? And what do you plan to do with the results? So before you sample, you really need to discuss with your lab the sampling requirements and the analysis methods. There are currently only two approved methods. Both are for drinking water. The EPA method 537.1 tests for 18 of the PFAS analytes, and method 533 tests for 25 of them. So remember, there's more than 5,000 in this group. There are a lot of other methods under development, including methods for wastewater, soils and sludges, air, and plant and animal tissue. The methods that labs are currently using for those medias are modifications of the drinking water methods. So um, you need to make sure that you get detailed sampling instruction with, from your lab along with your specific bottles. Remember, these are compounds that are everywhere. So there are very stringent sampling requirements. So some of the examples are do not wear clothing. The person that's sampling should not wear clothing that was dried with dryer sheets. You should not be wearing water resistant or water treated boots. Don't use permanent markers to label the bottles. Don't use bottles or sampling equipment with Teflon coating or Teflon tape or lids. And the, this is a very small list of the sampling instructions. Many of the lists I've seen are two or three pages long. So you need to be very careful and very sure if you are going to sample for these that you're following all of the sampling precautions. So if you find it in drinking water, what are your treatment options? There are four. So removal with granulated granular activated carbon GAC filter media, the addition of powder activated carbon PAC. There are specially ion exchange resins and nanofiltration or reverse osmosis will remove it. As a reminder, these remove the PFAS compounds, but they don't destroy them. So the disposal of the carbon from the uh, GAC or PAC or the residuals, the backwash water, the regen water, um, or the reject water becomes a huge issue. And that's because they bioaccumulate. So there are instances that have been documented where uh, wastewater or water plant has removed them. Uh, they accumulate in the wastewater treatment plant sludge. The sludge is applied to farm ground. Um, the farmers grow crops. Uh, cattle eat the crops, dairy cattle and the milk has to be destroyed or dumped because the PFAS end up in the milk. So they bioaccumulate, which means they just compound and they get passed along through the food chain. So remember that if you have them in your drinking water, you also need to consider what happens with the residuals and where you're going to go with that, that residual, that disposal issue after you remove it from the water. There are a number of resources out there. EPA has a PFAS website. A really good resource is the Interstate Technology and Regular, Regulatory Council, ITRC. They have very good fact sheets and videos, and they also have a very interesting table of state regulations. There's a tremendous amount of ongoing research into the toxicity, into testing methods, and into treatment. So there are a lot, um, a lot that's going on in this realm. 
And this is going to be a topic that you're going to hear talked about for a number of years to come. So lead and copper rule revision, shifting gears again. So the lead and copper proposed rule was published in November of 2019. I'm going to emphasize several times that this is a proposed rule. Uh, the lead and copper rule revision replaces the lead and copper long-term revisions, which we've talked about for years that they're coming. But this is now called the lead and copper rule revision, or LCRR. As a bit of history, the lead and copper rule was first promulgated in 1991. It was revised in 2000 and 2007. So this proposed rule builds on all of these existing rules. So this, the proposed rule includes a number of actions to reduce lead exposure from drinking water. It proposes to require systems to have plans in place to respond earlier to elevated lead levels. It includes efforts to improve transparency and communication. And this is EPA's sum summarization of the rule. It takes a proactive and holistic approach to improving the current rule from testing to treatment to telling the public about the levels and risks of lead in drinking water. So that's uh, what the EPA is, is saying about this rule. So the action levels remain the same and the action levels are based on the 90th percentile result. So lead stays at 0 0.015 milligrams per liter or 15 micrograms per liter parts per billion and copper stays at 1.3. The maximum contaminant level goals, the MCLGs, remain the same. The goal for lead is zero and the copper is 1.3. So there are six key areas in this proposed rule. So the first one is identifying areas most impacted. The second is strengthening drinking water treatment requirements. The third is replacing lead service lines. Next is increasing sampling reliability. The next is improving risk communication. And the final one is protecting children in schools and childcare facilities. So if you've not picked up on this already, there is a tremendous increased emphasis on lead. You're going to hear very little talked about copper in this rule, but the focus is lead. And we're going to talk about these key areas. So the first is identifying areas most impacted. So the proposed rules requires systems to develop a lead service line inventory and create a plan for removing lead service lines. So as a result of that inventory, systems would need to pay attention to individual locations uh, with elevated lead levels. Um, this is a separate issue. Um, so if you have a location that samples high for lead, you get a high result. Even if your 90th percentile is not above the action level, you're going to be required to go back to this individual location, do a additional investigation and sampling at that location, and uh, determine how you can mitigate the problem. EPA is calling this a find and fix solution but it's identifying what the issue is. And as several of you know, that's very difficult. If you've had a high lead level at a location in the past and DNR's asked you to go back in and look at that location and what's going on, it's very difficult sometimes to locate and find and fix that issue. But, but doing that, additional investigation and additional sampling at each location is going to be part of this rule. So lead service line inventory is a big, big portion. I would encourage you to start on this now. This requirement will include both the public and the private side of the system. So it includes material identification on all potable service lines, no matter the ownership. So you will be required to identify the material in each service line, no matter how your, your ownership in your system works. So that's going to be a tremendous um, investment of time for systems. 
It also, the proposed rule, and again, this is proposed, but all of our information indicates that the service line inventory will be part of the rule going forward no matter what. The proposed rule also requires updates each year. And there's some states that are already requiring this. And there are good guidance materials from the state of Ohio and Michigan and others. So most likely you'll be required to identify these types, the materials in these types of categories. So a lead service line, a line that has a lead gooseneck pigtail or connector, if it's galvanized steel, if it's copper with lead solder, if it's copper without lead solder, if it's plastic, if it's unknown but likely not lead, if it's unknown but likely lead, and if it's an other material and you need to list that material. So where do you start? I'd encourage you to start by gathering your existing information. You can do some generalized determinations based on the construction age of the home or the service line. What were your current uh, codes at that time? What were the practices in that part of the community? Did you have any ordinances in place in regard to lead construction, lead materials used in construction? And then any of your records on maintenance and procedures. So this is a list of resources to look at. So what was your plumbing code in your community? Did they have one? We have some communities in the state of Iowa that encouraged the use of lead. We have some that discouraged it. Do you know what, what your plumbing code was from years ago? Did your community issue plumbing permits? If so, where are those records? Can you access them? Did they do a good job of documenting what was, what was put in the ground? What do you know of, about your distribution system and do you have good maps and drawings? Do you have historical maps you can go back and look at? What about inspection and maintenance records? Have people been inside the homes to know what kind of materials coming in and connecting to the meter? Do you have meter installation records? What were the standard operating procedures? Do you have utility or city ordinances? Did, did your town adopt the uniform plumbing code at a certain date that, that banned lead materials? Do you have operation and maintenance manuals? What about permits? Do you have files? Do you have records? Do you have existing water quality data? Do you have senior personnel that have information? Do you have building inspectors? And retirees is a big one. So do you have retirees, do you have a plumber in your community that did a number of, of the service line work for a, for a development? Or as the, the community grew, did you have one plumber or a group of plumbers that did most of the work? If they're still around, go talk to them now. Get the information. See if they remember what they put in the ground. Maybe not at a specific location, but in general, what did they use? Do you have um, records of when you replace water mains? Did you find lead pigtails on all of these connections? You may need to do community surveys. What do people have that, that comes through the wall into, into their homes? What kind of material is that? And then any other resources, and I'd encourage you to be creative. Think about who might know, who might have information how can you get it? And what ways can you gather this information and document it? The second area is strengthening treatment requirements. So based on sampling results, systems with elevated lead levels would be required to reevaluate their existing corrosion control treatment. If you don't have corrosion control treatment, you'd be required to conduct a study so that you're prepared to respond if your levels exceed the action level. EPA does acknowledge that flexibility is important for small systems and so that you can protect public health by taking the action that makes sense for, for your community. It'll be interesting to see what kind of guidance they come out with and what, what uh, kind of flexibility that is allowed. So this proposed rule does include a new lead trigger level and that level's 10, 10 micrograms or 10 parts per billion of lead. 
At this trigger level, if you're a system that currently has corrosion control treatment, you'd be required to re-optimize that treatment. So that could be if you're a system greater than 50,000 that has corrosion control treatment, or if you're a smaller system that has had uh, lead exceedance in the past and you've installed either a phosphate or a pH adjustment system uh, as part of that corrosion control treatment. Systems that don't treat for corrosion would be required to conduct a corrosion control study so that you have that information in case your levels would exceed the action level. The third part of the proposed rule is replacing lead service lines. So if you're a system that has uh, lead levels that exceed the trigger level, and this is the trigger level, not the action level, so the trigger level of 10 parts per billion, you'd be required to work with the state to set an annual goal for replacing the lead service lines. If you are a system that has a lead action level above 10 parts per billion, you'd be required to fully replace a minimum 3% of the known or potential. And I'm going to I'm going to emphasize it includes or potential lead service lines annually. So that's why it's really important when you're doing your lead inventory if you've got unknown um, but potential lead to try and do everything you can to identify that material because Throughout this rule, potential lead service lines are treated as lead service lines. And then this again is EPA's language. So the proposed rule would require interrelated activities combined with transparency and outreach requirements. And this will increase the rate of lead service line replacements. So as we're aware of what's happened in Flint, is that they're going through and replacing lead service lines. But one of the um, tremendous complaints about what went on there was their inability or their inaction of replacing lead service lines. So this rule really um, increases the requirement for re lead service line replacement. The proposed rule also prohibits tests out to avoid replacing lead service lines. So that's uh, invalidation of sampling sites and the ability to say, no, our action level's okay, so we don't have an issue. So be aware that, that sampling is going to be very important. And uh, it's if you have a site that tests high, you're not going to be able to invalidate that site, so you need to do a tremendous increase in sampling instructions and doing your homework and your research about a site before you add it to your sampling plan. Partial lead service line replacements will no longer be allowed except in emergency situations. So if you have a, a break and it's an emergency repair, those types of situations. There's been a tremendous amount of research that show that partial lead service line replacement increases lead exposure short term. The proposed rule also includes requiring systems to provide uh, lead pitcher filters for a period of time after uh, service line replacements, lead service line replacements. And so that was in the proposed rule. We'll see if that comes through in the final rule. But just be aware that that would be the system's responsibility, the way the proposed rule is written, to provide pitcher filters for lead removal after a lead service line replacement. The fourth area is increasing sampling reliability. So the proposed rule um, is the rule is pro uh, proposing several changes to sampling procedures. These would include things like wide mouth bottles for collection, prohibiting flushing and cleaning or removing the faucet aerator before sampling. It includes changing the criteria for selecting homes where samples are collected. And so currently there are three tier classifications. This proposed rule changes that to four tiers. It also requires that all of your sampling sites be from locations with lead service lines if you have that. And so that will be a change in sampling plan and we 
we um, anticipate that there will be a number of sampling plan updates that will need to be done. And then systems with higher lead levels will be required to sample more frequency, more frequently. And so the sample frequency of every six months going to annually to going to every three years is also proposed to change. Fifth one is improving risk communication. So the proposed rule will require systems to notify customers of an action level exceedance within 24 hours. So if you've got any location that exceeds the action level, whether or not the system Y does, you'll be required to notify those customers within 24 hours, the same as you would for um, an acute MCL violation. And then the rule proposes that systems make your lead service line inventory publicly available and conduct regular outreach to homeowners with lead service lines or, again, unknown materials. So one of the things that uh, some of the states have required that are, that are already requiring inventories is to post either a map online of your system showing the materials or some type of documentation so your customers can easily see what their home or their residence has. So when uh, Brent talks about uh, mapping and modeling in the next presentation, I'd encourage you to pay attention to that and think about how you could use mapping to show that, that your lead service line inventory to your customers. You can also go to um, State of Ohio website and uh, State of Michigan, and those states are already listing um, their lead service line with links to maps and links to their inventories. So if you want to see how some other states are requiring it to be done, those are already out there and available. The sixth one is protecting children in schools. So since children are most at risk, and we saw this particularly in Flint, EPA is proposing that community water systems sample 20% of the drinking water taps at each school and at each child care facility served by your system. So think about the schools in your system. Think about the child care facilities. The rule also includes language uh, that would say and locations where uh, children have educational opportunities. So it will be interesting to see the definition of that. But this is uh, going to be the responsibility of the community water system to do this sampling, or at least to, to make sure that it happens. Uh, and I think the way the rule was going to be written, it's going to require the system to do the sampling. So the system would be required to provide the results and information about actions the school or the child care facility can take to reduce lead in drinking water. So the next steps um, are that the comment period, so remember, this is a proposed rule. So the comment period closed uh, February 12th of this year. EPA received approximately 80,000 comments. Those comments were both um, in favor of the proposed rule and against the proposed rule. And those against the proposed rule were some that, that stated that the rule did not go far enough, and others that thought the rule went too far. So EPA is currently uh, reviewing and evaluating all of those comments. And their goal is to promulgate the final lead and copper rule revisions this summer. We'll see with the COVID actions if that happens, but that would be uh, the goal that they've stated and the goal that uh, they are moving forward with. So at that, are there any questions? I don't see any in the chat. Um, hopefully, all of you who had issues um, 
So um, one of the other things that we would talk about is both DNR and EPA have granted some extensions to compliance schedules due to the COVID-19 situation. So if you are a system that has um, a compliance schedule and you are having trouble achieving that, I would encourage you um, to contact your uh, DNR field office or central office contact and to uh, discuss with them the challenges that you're seeing getting that compliance schedule done the, uh, or completed and submitted, the challenges that you're, you're seeing due to the COVID-19 and request an extension. Um, we have been told that there will not be extensions for your risk assessment, your risk and resilience assessment, or your emergency response plan, because those are things that you can do without um, having people present. You can do that conversation virtually. And that because that is a federal law, not a rule, EPA doesn't have the ability to extend those deadlines. Other questions? So the lead invent the question is, uh, is there a date that the lead inventory needs to be done by? Because this is a proposed rule, there is not a deadline. Uh, the way the proposed rule is written is that inventory will, will be required within one year of the promulgation of the final rule. There were a lot of comments that that was too fast and systems would not be able to get it done in that length of time, which is one reason I encourage you to start on it now. Um, but it does, um, that was the way the proposed rule is written. We'll see how it comes out in the final rule. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none, we will switch uh, presenters and I will turn it over to uh, Kelly Evans and Brent Page and about water modeling and uh, water tower design and maintenance. Thanks, Julie. I'll get I'll get our presentation pulled up here. Getting a little what? bit of lag. While they're doing that, I would just encourage you, if you have more than one person at your site, um, please um, send us a list of the people on your site. If you are having issues um, logging in, um, I think hopefully we've got all those resolved, but uh, log out and log back in and then the slides will display. Here we go. I think I got everything. You see that, Julie? I can. It looks good, Brett. Okay. Well, I guess we'll we'll go ahead and get started a little early then, um, buy us some time, and move right along through. Um, good presentation, Julie. Um, a lot of good information in there. Um, Today, uh, transitioning into what we're going to talk about this morning, um, water tower for water modeling, um, water tower design, and um, some of the assessment and maintenance of, of water towers. Um, first of all, good morning, everybody. Um, you know, I'm, I'm personally excited to see the, uh, uh, the attendance that um, we we're able to get and glad everyone could join in on the class today. Um, should have some good uh, information in here. Um, one to take away from. So um, presenter overview, and I'll try not to click through here too fast because it looks like there was a little lag um, in Julie's presentation. But um, I'm Brett Page, uh, civil engineer uh, with ISV. Um, I have about 10 years experience in water system modeling and distribution system evaluation. 
Um, I've modeled towns uh, less than 500 people up to 70 or 80,000. So um, quite the wide range of uh, system size and experience there. And I'm going to uh, talk to you today about some water system modeling processes and some of those capabilities. Kelly Evans, um, water wastewater engineer with uh, ISG. Um, Kelly's going to be talking to you today about water tower design. And Kelly, has, or he's a licensed engineer and the operator. Uh, he assists in operations for several small towns um, across Iowa and leads water and wastewater designs for ISP throughout the Midwest. So, um, and then uh, Sean Mulhern uh, with KLM, he's the pre president and CFO. Um, we didn't have a, a picture of Sean, so you'll just have to uh, picture the KLM logo when, when he starts talking. But he's going to run through some water tower assessment uh, processes, inspection, and maintenance practices. And Sean has over 36 years uh, experience in the field of testing and inspecting water towers. And he's been involved with the inspection of over 1,000 water storage tanks. And he's also a certi he's certified with the National Association of Corrosion Engineers and American Welding Society. Okay, so I'll, I'll kick off with my piece here. Um, going to talk to you guys today a little bit about water system modeling and some of the processes that uh, go into that, you know, what we're looking for and, uh, you know, what we can do with this asset management tool that we have. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I have you know, over 10 years, or right around 10 years of experience, and you know, I've seen some some uh, progression over the last decade in the software capabilities, and some of the things that we can do today are, you know, quite impressive to see. You know, the engineering power that we have at our fingertips, and how quickly um, we can evaluate system criteria. So some of the objectives I want to highlight um, up front, uh, not enough time to talk about everything, but wanted to hit the high points and what everyone uh, can walk away with from today. Um, understand why modeling is useful. You know, what can we do with the water model? Um, what do we look at? And most importantly, where is the value um, for a community or municipality? Uh, what information is needed? There's a ton of data out there. Uh, Ju Julie talked about that as far as the, um, the, the amount of work to gather information, records, plans, um, breaks, test data, and personnel knowledge. Um, this one can sometimes be overlooked, and it's just as valuable as, it, as anything. Just because something's not written down or uh, necessarily on uh, a, a, a set of plans doesn't mean it's not valuable. Um, it doesn't have to be in a file drawer. Um, all of that information is useful to us when we're um, building these, uh, these hydraulic models of your system. And then understanding the capabilities, um, what we're looking at, what information we can evaluate, and what types of analysis are possible um, with the software. So water modeling, uh, I guess a brief breakdown of, uh, of, of what, what that necessarily is. It's um, some of the software packages that we're using now, um, they're really an extension of GIS that's integrated into ArcMap um, software. It's basically a mapping program, uh, which makes it simple to produce maps and, and report deliverables and query data um, as we build the models and be able to um, accurately um, construct those. And Julie met, mentioned this in her presentation about documenting uh, water network assets and, and, and features. And, you know, really this is part of the process as we build these things um, with that information that's required for the models. Um, you know, it's really the, the basis of a good hydraulic model is an accurate map and good data. And that's just something to consider is those requirements, potential requirements get pushed out and um, things that might be coming down the pipe later on. Um, so I guess the, 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 the skeleton of a model is a link node based network. Um, to, to simplify that. So your pipes are modeled as links. Um, so lines um, in the map and then nodes would, would then be your tanks, your pumps, your valves, um, any connections that you have throughout the city, uh, your crosses, your T's, and then also any dissimilar pipe materials um, that uh, would be connected. Anything that has a different characteristic will we'll, we'll input a node there so the model knows to 
um, account for those changes um, as it goes through the calculations. Um, water comes out of the network in a water model. Um, I like to make the comparison of you know, storm and sanitary modeling. We put water in, um, we push water through the system to see how it responds to that stress. Um, well, here, uh, the water system, we're concerned about what's coming out of the model and you know what, um, how are the facilities responding? Um, is, there, is there low pressure? Uh, you know, things like that. So um, just a, a little different perspective, but you know, with most fluid modeling um, practices, we're typically wanting to evaluate what the capacity um, impacts look like in the system. And then scenario-based, we're looking at um, average and max daily scenarios, uh, average days, so throughout a typical year, uh, max day, uh, likely during a summer month, um, where you see a lot of irrigation or people fill in their pools, wanting to see what um, how the system behaves and responds um, when we apply those demand scenarios on there, and even down to a peak hour, um, to see what that high stress um, does to the system and, and, and how the facilities can respond to that. Uh, the two types of um, analysis that we'll run is uh, steady state, um, and that's really a, a, a defined uh, shot screenshot in time. We'll define the criteria that we want to look at um, and get instantaneous results, and then extended period simulation. Um, that's really what uh, that sounds like. It's a it's a it's a model simulation over a duration. Um, allows us to account for diurnal patterns throughout the day uh, based on land use type. You know, people showering in the morning or doing dishes cooking at night, you get a little bit more of a peak um, during those times. It allows us to be able to see that um, overlaid over an entire day. And then also looking at seasonal fluctuations um, that can happen too. And no system is really too small or too big. You know, I mentioned that, you know, I've got some experience with you know, towns that are small as 500 people up to, you know, multiple thousands. So um, the, the advantages of, uh, of having a water model or, you know, there's not really a bound to size. Um, it's, a, it, it's a great asset management tool for um, really, you know, all systems. So just wanted to show a, a, a screenshot of, you know, a completed water model that we recently um, it, it, it completed and calibrated. You know, this is for a town of about 3,000 people. Some, some of the audience might recognize this network. Um, I, I can't quite recall how the, the length of water main, but um, you know, what, what I wanted to display here is just some of the capabilities that we can produce with the digital media. You know, once we have a, a created model, you know, what that looks like, I, I chose diameter. Um, it seems to be the, uh, I don't know, that's, that's my preference when, with, with, as far as my standard display that I'm looking at, um, you know, you can kind of see uh, the city from an overall scale and then um, the connectivity uh, throughout the network as far as pipe diameters go. And um, each of the assets displayed here, uh, there's information stored um, behind that asset that the model references in a table. And that's shown in the bottom right corner for a, a point to a pipe right there. Um, all the important characteristics that, uh, that need to be input for the model to to be able to run and um, uh, complete the calculations for head loss and, and other things are um, stored in a table. So, you know, I, I mentioned GIS earlier, it's really the same concept um, running through that software. Um, and then I guess it, if we wanted to look at other features as far as model outputs, um, we can overlay materials in the map, um, pressure velocities, um, water age, uh, you know, there's really a, 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 an endless list of things that we can we can revise and be able to quickly produce these maps once the model is built. So why do we create models? Um, because they're cool, right? Um, you know, we can make cool maps with color, uh, you know, press buttons, you know, the, make cool sounds. Um, you know, I, I personally enjoy the, the process of putting these together and, 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 and getting to the end result of, uh, of having, you know, a, a, an operable model that you know you have confidence in but really the, um, the 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 big piece of that is we're able to perform hydraulic calculations on a massive scale thousands and thousands of calculations are at the click of a button so that's uh, one of the uh, key things that, that um, why we create um, system models uh, we want to understand the system fill in data gaps sometimes results can lead to uh, 
being able to figure something out that maybe he didn't know, uh, information that's, uh, uh, you know, that we can't quite figure out, um, that's not documented. Um, you know, sometimes running these things and being able to uh, put pieces together can shed some light on, on some of those unknowns. Um, identify issues and future problems. Is there a reason that uh, we're having breaks in one location? Is it not related to age or maybe weather? Is there another issue? Um, once we have a, a complete model, uh, we can quickly evaluate alternatives. If, uh, for example, if you're wanting to consider a development on the outside of town, uh, you're not sure what pipe size to put in. Do you, do you need a six? Do you need an eight? Um, that's just something that uh, we can we can evaluate um, once everything is up and running and calibrated. Mapping figures, and there's there's many, many other reasons. Uh, you know, it's really just a powerful tool that can that can do a lot of things. A kind of a generic run here. Uh, the, it's the process of, that we go through to build to build a hydraulic model. I you know I could have I could only put four boxes on here, so save you guys some pain. I probably could have put thirty if I had room, but you could almost consider each one of these has several sub criteria beneath of the work that goes into um, getting a complete model and, and getting it ready to run. Um, so gather and review information. That's going to be collecting everything that you have on file. Um, all, the, all the plan data, um, water use records, um, meeting with operators, city staff, just trying to get a general understanding, um, a holistic understanding of the system and how that operates. Uh, then moving on to creating mapping files, shape files, um, doing uh, completing water use projection um, analysis, and then importing all that information in the model um, and getting it ready to run. And then once we have a network that's built, we have to make sure that it's uh, representative of real system results. So we we do uh, uh, have to go out and do some hydrant testing um, and calibration uh, to make sure that we can simulate um, that the, the records that were taken um, at the time of those tests. So um, once we have everything that uh, we have confidence in, the results that we're getting, we're ready to run scenarios and uh, review and evaluate results. And the, Scenarios that are selected to run really depend on the goals of the community and um, the goals of the project itself. So some of the critical model features, um, everyone in the audience I'm sure is familiar with, with everything in this list, um, but the, the, the point uh, to, to take away is what is important of these features that the model needs to be able to run. Um, so water main, we need diameter, length, and material. Um, that's really the materials really the roughness uh, an example of this would be um, you know as water moves throughout the system uh, the, the the largest uh, contrib contribution to head loss is going to be the friction losses that are occurred incurred throughout the system so um, that's forces being pushed back on the water as it moves um, between the wall the pipe um, you know the, the smoother the wall the less of that friction is going to be so a PVC pipe if you could consider the same diameter is going to have less head loss than say a cast iron that's a, a, a little rougher uh, pumps looking for elevation data where those are located um, flow head curves efficiency points is there a vfd um, do we know the impeller size it's the, the impeller been switched or changed um, shaves all of that is important uh, tanks what we need here is the minimum elevation and maximum elevation of uh, the water level uh, to determine our source pressure gradients. Uh, valves settings, are they closed or open? Are certain areas of the city isolated? Uh, are there any PRVs between pressure zones? And do we know those settings? And then reservoirs, these are really the source of water um, that, uh, that, that brings water into the model. Uh, typically, these will be located near your treatment plant. And really, they uh, are used to create a boundary head condition the rest of the system calculates from um, to determine uh, head losses and pressure. So model development, um, the key information that we're looking for in this list, you know, there's not really a, a, a limit, um, but looking for network plans if you have them, um, water tower data, um, pump stations, water mains. That This one is really helpful if you have water main plans of, of your system, being able to lay those out um, on the table, hard copies, and just kind of go through by hand. 
um, really improves um, the, the accuracy and, and, and how we can build these to make sure that um, everything is uh, in there appropriately. Water use records looking for sale data. Um, and if, if, if it's available by property type, um, it's, it's nice. And what, what we end up doing typically is breaking out uh, uh, residential versus non-residential um, into the model for uh, inputting demands. And, uh, uh, you know, if that's, if that's available, that's great. Otherwise we can, we can make some assumptions ourselves and then we'll, we'll input, um, any high users, any high industrial or commercial, um, those will have their own, uh, their own demand based on the, the water sale data that is available. Um, pump curves and operation characteristics, uh, you know, talked about this a minute ago, um, and pillar sizes, if it's been shaved, you know, any modification to the pump. You know, the age will be important uh, just so we know uh, when we're running the model for that pump, uh, there might, there's likely going to be a difference in what the pump curve actually says out of the, out of the catalog to what is being uh, actually uh, reported in the field. So being able to make those um, uh, considerations is important to, to know the, the model results are going to result um, in similar um, how the how the system actually reacts uh, in real time. Facility settings, you know, what levels do the pumps turn on? Uh, does uh, the level in the tower turn on the pump? Um, what are the maximum levels in the water tower? Are there valves downstream that close and open based on a pressure setting? Uh, those are important to know. And then you know, there's just a limitless amount of data that, 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 we, can, that we can pick through and more of it is, it is better less assumptions we have to make um, is going to create a, a more accurate model and we can be even more confident in the results that are that are coming out of that. So inputting demands, um, you know, we're going to reference water use records. Uh, we can also uh, utilize SUDOS to uh, uh, some of the area based water consumption metrics. We can we can project that out. Um, but we'll We'll go through um, in the network. Uh, there's nodes located throughout, um, like here. We won't do individual houses um, and unless that's a, a goal of the project. But typically, we'll do an entire block, um, put on the you know one node, and put that, that that water demand being pulled out of the system at that location. Elevation data. We don't necessarily need survey level data. Um, typically, we'll just use lidar um, to pull a surface and. Uh, just assign elevations based on the surface, um, the, the LIDAR flown elevation. And hydrant testing, uh, calibration, uh, we'll go through the, the field testing processes. Um, got kind of an example of one here. Um, you know, the, the, the test that was done, what the, the metrics that were reported from the test, and uh, our flow hydrant as far as what the flows were reported. We'll dive into that detail in a second. So hydrant testing each test, and it, this is going to be a real brief uh, breakdown, um, I guess, but uh, each test will include two hydrants, a static and residual. It's important to make sure your keto hydrant is further from the boundary head so you get that flow going past the static and residual um, to, to get even better information. There's really no rule on the number of tests. We're just looking for an even distribution um, throughout the network and making sure that uh, we have a just a, a, a good understanding of pressures throughout the system. And it's important to be able to record the boundary head facilities um, at the time of the test. So when the tests are being run, we need to know the uh, height in the tower, what's the water level, um, pump efficiency settings and flow settings, what are the, what gallons per minute are we getting out of our pumps and any valves that are closed or open. Calibration, we'll take that hydrant test data and we'll input the flows and we'll start pulling water from the system at those locations and you know, we'll be checking the pressures and seeing if we can get similar results. Um, we'll check the connectivity throughout the system. There's crosses all over the place and uh, you know, sometimes if we get pressures that are off, it's, it's indicative of something's not connected in the right spot. Uh, water's having to flow further or it's getting there too fast to, to, to not get the pressure drop or Maybe we have too much pressure. Uh, we'll adjust pipe roughness coefficients, um, ele elevations of facilities and boundary head. Um, all of that is uh, some of the things we look for as we go through calibration. 
uh, mapping output, just an example of some of the things we can we can overlay uh, once we have everything up and running. Um, this is just an example of a contour map based on pressure. Uh, you know, kind of see how we can overlay this over the top of the system to um, view the pressure gradient from a you know, holistic view. And we can do this with other characteristics pretty easily once once everything is set up. So some of the capabilities quick here. Um, you know, we can look at the pipe capacity, facility capacities. Um, do we have enough pressure? Uh, is the water supply or storage adequate and accurate? And, and accurate sorry. Uh, fire flow analysis, you know, we can see, uh, we can look at different areas of the system, like either one spot or we can do multiple um, fire flow locations and see what the pressures that we get there, um, looking for compliance with ISO, the insurance service office. Um, for that flow, uh, they require to be maintained above 20 PSI. Uh, we can pick a spot in town to look at the great, um, great simulations. You know, what happens if a uh, water main bust here? Um, how does the system respond? We can uh, trace chemicals, chlorine residuals, water age, um, uh, tank cycle to make sure that our tanks are cycling within uh, the appropriate uh, time frames that, that are required or recommended. And then just a quick example for how we can help facilitate some water tower design to tran transition into to Kelly's presentation. Um, what the figure that's shown here in the, the upper right, um, we've overlaid a, a DEM, so a surface um, file uh, over the city's network. And we can locate you know, what's where are the high points in town. Typically, that's where we're going to look first. Um, and what height do we want to set the water tower? Uh, it can help. You know, with uh, as far as a cost benefit analysis, you know, if you, if you go to the highest point, um, your water tower may not need to be as high as it as other areas to get that pressure that you need. Um, looking at downstream impacts, um, you know, is there, is there enough pressure? Is there too much pressure? And then looking at capacity, um, you know, what what um, volume are we or do we need uh, for the system? Um, with the water tower that, that, that we're looking at. So, um, you know, the, one, of the, one of the benefits of, of having a hydraulic model is you can, um, instead of you know, doing, it, doing calculations by hand for maybe just one, two, or three locations, you can um, you know, look at you know, hundreds or wh whatever the, the, um, some of the capabilities to, to, to perform calculations on a mass scale is, is one of the benefits of the tool um, that we can uh, be able to utilize to instantly perform those um, next expedite from the design process. So with that, over to Kelly here. Yep, Brett, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. All um, right. Um, <clears throat> I think you hit on some of the questions, though. Um, you have had to adjust C factors and pipes, haven't you, to fit actual flow testing results? Yes. Okay, and then it looked like, um, just because I've seen it before too, that was the city of Clarion you're using for some of the examples. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. And Brett, actually, if you want to continue sharing your screen on that presentation. Okay. And one last question, Brett, can you do water age analysis through that water modeling as well? Yes. Yes, you can. And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, Quite similar to what we're doing as far as mapping this way, we can, we can map out certain um, within hours or days of the water age throughout the system. Great. Okay, well, like Brad said, I'm Kelly Evans. Um, I'm going to be discussing water tower design. There'll be a little bit of overlap between me and Sean Mulhern as far as water tower types and stuff, but we'll kind of rush through that as there's some overlap there. But uh, you can go to the next page, Brett. Um, so basically the object objectives of what I'm going to be discussing, I'm going to review different types of water storage that are out there, um, kind of help for anybody listening to determine what is the best fit for them and their community or their industry. Um, looking at design considerations when going through design, you as the operators need to work closely with your engineer and take into consideration some of these design aspects um, that you may want to help prevent different things in your system or help improve existing things in your system and then look at some relative costs on different sizes and different types of storage tanks. Next page.
page. All right, different storage types. There's ground storage reservoirs, and there's also elevated storage reservoirs. Um, there's different types within those on the ground storage side. There's um, glass fused steel. There's steel, stainless steel. On elevated storage tanks, there's composites, um, basic steel, and we'll kind of go for further into details on those as we go forward onto the onto the presentation. Go ahead and move forward. Ground storage reservoir basically um, y it typically requires a larger ground footprint on ground storage reservoir that can be adjusted depending on what capacity you're going after. Um, a lot of your engineers working with manufacturers can get their capacity charts um, and I, I'm not sharing it right now but I'm looking at it. I mean you can go from diameters from 11 foot all the way up to 104 feet in diameter. Um, but then that adjusts your sidewall height, obviously, too, to get the capacities that you need. Um, working with the manufacturer, you can tell them what volume you need, which is one of the main deciding factors. And then they can tell you, based on that volume, what um, sidewall height and diameter is the most economical for that situation. Now, if you're constricted with footprint and everything ground, well, then you might be constricted to your sidewall height being a little bit higher. Um, but that's just something to consider on each individual project, what is going to be best for you. We've had several communities where they have really no ground to put the storage on, so we compact it down to 11 or 14 foot diameter, but our sidewall height can jump dramatically all the way up to about, um, about 130 feet, just depending on the volume that you need on that. So. Um, ground storage reservoirs also typically require repressur repressurization after storage. Um, we have several communities that, you know, the well pumps it into that uh, ground storage tank, uh, but then they need to repressurize the system afterwards to keep the system pressurized because you're not getting the head elevation to assist in that like you would with the elevated water tower. Um, I have in here, typically it does not require paint. That's dependent on the type of ground storage tank you have. I mean, you can have a concrete one as well. Obviously, you wouldn't really need a paint on that, but you can have a glass view steel, which also isn't a paint, um, but you can have a steel one that would require paint, or there's stainless steel as well. Next page. Again, I kind of already went through this, the height versus diameter deal, but work with your engineer closely on that. Um, they can help to determine what is the best height versus diameter that you're trying to achieve here. Um, a lot of these will a lot of towns or some of our smaller towns will use these also as elevated quote unquote elevated storage tanks and just remembering that the bottom so many feet are going to allow for maintaining your minimum 20 psi and the rest is your storage volume above that so that would also play into the sidewall height of your ground storage tank next page elevated storage tanks um, they typically have a smaller ground footprint, whereas most of your storage is you know, in the air, so that's where most of the footprint is. Um, it doesn't require repressurization after storage for the most part, just depending on if you got different pressure zones and towns and everything. Um, but it typically does require paint. Now there's different types of elevated water towers um, where certain areas won't require paint. Um, and we'll get into that more detail when I look at the different types of water towers that are out there. Uh, but painting is usually a large cost of the um, of your property right there on the water tower. Um, so keeping that in mind when you're choosing what kind of water tower you want to do and as far as repainting cost, um, we just bid out a 125,000 gallon, I believe, water tower, which was upwards of about $250,000, $300,000 just for recoating of it. That was with sandblasting as well, too. Um, and when you get into sandblasting, you also might need protective coatings to prevent from spray and everything like that. Um, more expensive, definitely, on an elevated water tower, but again, you, you lose some of the infrastructure costs as far as repressurization with additional pumps and everything. And there's several types of these elevated water towers. There's composite, there's multi-column, single pedestal, and fluted column. Go ahead and go to the next page. All right, a composite water tower, um, kind of what the name states, it's usually a concrete pedestal on the bottom that holds up your steel water tower on top. Um, that creates less painting area because the um, pedestal itself 
doesn't need to be painted, so that's just a saved cost in the future. Um, usually you see these in, um, in communities that need storage of 500,000 gallons and, and, and above. There is an interior ladder system within that concrete pedestal that brings it up so it's a little bit more secure as far as keeping people out and there's not just a ladder on the outside that someone can go climb. Um, I state that there's less O&M and that's more, more or less due to the less paint area that needs to be maintained. Um, but your typical painting should last you anywhere if it's done right upwards of 30 years. So that's the key though is if it's done right and Sean may go into that a little bit more too and I discuss on it a little bit more later on too. They also use these composite tanks um, within that concrete pedestal as typical storage. Um, you'll see them around communities where they'll have a garage door in that concrete pedestal where that they store vehicles, um, maintenance equipment, everything like that. So that's another added benefit of these composite systems. Next tank. Multi-column. Um, Sean can probably speak more to this when he gets going, but you don't see as many of these going up. It's usually preferred in areas of high wind or seismic activity. Um, one of the issues with these multi-column tanks is that there's just a lot of surface area to paint. If you have like a pedestal tank where it just has one, t um, one riser going up, that's a lot less surface area than every single leg, every single strut between every one of these legs. There's just a lot more surface area to cover and paint. Um, but again, it becomes um, a very good option to use when there's high wind or seismic activity in the area, which hopefully in the Midwest we don't have the seismic activity, but it's something to consider. Typically has an exterior balcony on it um, and a central welded steel riser. Uh, again, like I said, it has all these horizontal struts and diagonal bracing rods that all need a paint coating as well, too. So that adds to the surface area of paint and also just the complexity of painting and getting all those angles and everything else properly covered. Um, welded steel legs and a welded steel tank. So the whole thing is all steel. Um, in most circumstances, though, it is the most cost effective in the original construction. But as far as the um, painting and maintenance going on in the future, the O&M starts to rise on these tanks. Next slide. Single pedestal is what we see a lot, um, typically in the Midwest, um, on newer designs, or at least recently. It's a single welded steel pedestal supporting a welded steel tank. Um, this is where I was talking about where you just have one uh, pedestal going all the way up. There's less surface area going around that larger diameter than there is all those individual legs at a smaller diameter. Um, and painting complexity, I mean, you're, you're talking about <laughs> Uh, a single sheet of metal all the way up that you're painting instead of different grooves and angles and everything else. A lot less to uh, complex there. Typically has a smaller compact construction footprint. Um, again, less surface area. An interior ladder system, which again provides for a little bit more security as far as someone getting in. There's locks on the door, on the access door, on the bottom of that tank pedestal. Um, and it's just a simplicity in design as far as construction and ability on that. Instead of all the legs and struts, it's just one tower pedestal rising up. Next slide. Fluted column. Um, this is a steel pedestal. It's kind of like the composite, but the, instead of a concrete pedestal, it's a steel pedestal supporting a welded steel tank. Um, constructed of carbon steel, and there's more rigidity and stability than the composite on this one for seismic activity. Again, this is the same as the composite though, whereas a lot of facilities will use the base cone to use for storage and everything like that. Um, again, it also protects for um, unauthorized access because the access ladder is typically on the inside of that pedestal. Next slide. A Little bit of comparison of each option. When the community is looking at a new water tower, um, Typically, they'll just take the engineer's uh, recommendation on that, but I encourage all operators to work with their engineer and look at O&M cost, um, life cycle cost on all these towers, and kind of what they'll be involved in for a 20, 30, 40, 50 year design life cycle. Again, a composite um, is typically used for 500,000 gallons and plus. Um, so a lot of the smaller towns that are listening probably wouldn't be considering something like this, but there is less O&M in the long run and there's storage uh, availability underneath that tank. 
a multi-column, which a lot of towns that are replacing their towers right now have, um, can go about any size, but there is more O&M when it comes to recoding of these water towers. A lot of small towns are surprised when they get um, an inspection report from their inspector stating, hey, you need recoding interior and exterior. Um, you need to bring it up to OSHA codes and standards um, where that cost price tag gets to be half to three quarters of just doing a new water tower. Um, but again, we don't see much of these um, going up for new tanks, um, but they are around and still preferred um, in some instances. Next slide. Single pedestal is what we've been doing a lot of lately. Um, again, there's less surface area than like your multi-leg columns. It's secure, just like the composite was in the fluted column is. And it's just a compact construction that goes up fairly rapidly. Um, we see these a lot for smaller volume tanks, but have done them up to a, a half a million gallon worth of volume in the water tower. A fluted column, um, again, has storage underneath just like the composite, but there's a lot of surface area on these um, compared to the single pedestal because that pedestal is um, a lot wider going up. But again, it offers the security just like the pedestal does and the composite does. Um, but there's just a lot of surface area here for painting going forward. Next slide. So which is best for you and your community or industry? It all comes down to preferences and volumes required. Um, the volume as far as what's required is pretty easy to determine once looking at your guys' water use uh, data. So then it comes down to, okay, based on that volume, what do we want to use? Obviously with the 500,000 gallon plus, um, on the composites, okay, that might cut your option out down to three. And then also looking at O&M cost, your engineer should be able to run cost estimates for all those different sizes and kind of what you'd be looking at for cost on each option. Um, but then they can also run cost estimates for O&M as far as, okay, based on that surface area, you're probably looking at X amount of dollars for recoding interior and exterior. Um, and you got to recode every 20 or 30 years. This is kind of your design life cycle cost. And if you want to look at that, your engineer should be able to assist you with that and help you make that decision. Um, but again, it comes down a lot to preferences and just what that community prefers and what they like or dislike about each different design. A lot of design considerations go into um, doing your water tower. A big one is mixing. Um, I'm a big proponent of getting mixing within your water storage. Um, that can be passive or active, which I'll go through a little bit later. Protective coating is also another big thing. Paint acts to protect the investment that you've made. So having a good paint coating over the steel structure is gonna prolong the life of that structure and just add you know, aesthetics is going to be a big thing too. So um, protective coating is very important. Um, volume and pressure requirements within the community. We're working with one smaller community right now that um, volume wasn't the big issue. It was pressures in town. They could barely get their showers on the second floor buildings of houses to barely just sprinkle out of their shower heads. Um, so we actually are doing a t new tower with a higher pressure zone, raising up the elevation of the tower to get more pressure. That comes with some issues as well too, which I'll discuss later. Um, but those are things to consider as well in your design objectives. Aesthetics, um, there's multiple options for colors and logos that you can do on these towers. Um, you've seen some of the example pictures that I put in the other slides. You can do multiple logos, um, Sean, can probably discuss on it a little bit more too, but we've seen very decorative water towers, um, lighted water towers. Uh, there's multiple options you can do. And as far as logos go to um, your engineer or you can hire some other consultant can help develop a logo for the your industry or city if you don't already have one. And then again, it just comes down to preference on type of that water tower that you want between single pedestal, fluted column, um, composite going forward. So. Next slide. There's a lot of importance to mixing. Um, 
a lot of communities will see loss of chlorine residuals in their system because their water tower is not turning over. As the water goes into your water tower, it pumps it into the bottom of the water tower. Well then, where does it take it from? It takes it from the bottom of the water tower. So there could be a 10, 20 degree difference between the bottom of that water tower and the top of the water tower because that new water is always on the bottom and it's always taking out new water. So the, the old water sits on top and keeps staying there where you get loss of chlorine residual. Um, you can get DBP, uh, disinfection byproducts, um, nitrification, you can get biofilms, and it can start to cause issues with taste and odor in your distribution system. A lot of causes of this is obviously poor mixing, short circuiting, which I was talking about where it's just pulling it right from the bottom of the tank and then putting it right back into the bottom of the tank. Long detention times, we had one community that would see swings in water use in summertime upwards of 300,000 gallons and during the wintertime 50,000 gallons. So they obviously wanted storage to combat the water demand during the summertime, um, but during the wintertime they had long detention time, so we needed mixing for that. And then, like I said, thermal stratification as far as temperature changes from the bottom of the tank to the top of the tank. That can also cause sweating on the outside of the water tower. Um, which can become an issue as far as your coatings and just deterioration of your investment that you made in the water tower. Next slide. Passive mixing systems um, is typically mixes during the fill cycle. So you're already pumping into your system. What it does is, one example is a tide flux mixing system. It uses a duckbill valve that um, pressurizes the water as it comes in a little bit more and shoots it out at different angles to help with mixing, to shoot the water up to the top of the tank, um, to mix the water and bring the water that's at the top of the tank back down. But it's only mixing during those fill cycles. There's options you can do with, at least with the Tide Flex mixing system, to add a, uh, a mixing pump down at the base of the tank. So your only mechanical system you have to maintain is down at the base of the tank where you can easily access it. That you can do 15, 20 minutes where it's continually shooting through those uh, duckbill valves to continue mixing, making it more of an active mixing system than passive at that, at, for that example. Active mixing systems is a mechanical mixer. It's 24-7. You, you can obviously go in there. There'll be a switch at the base of the tower where you can turn it on and off. Um, but that's continually mixing the system, mixing the tank, preventing icing of the tank, um, thermal stratification, um, and assisting with all the other things like DBP, thermal stratification, everything else. Um, you can use a pack system, a solar B or grid B air bubblers or like I stated above the um, active tide flex mixing system where we add a recirculation pump at the bottom of the tank. Next slide. Protective coating is very important. Um, I stated before that thermal stratification can allow for sweating on the outside of the tower. That water on the outside of the tower will run down. It can cause mildew and mold to grow on the outside of your tank. So the paint is very important to help protect your steel structure that you invested in, but also just keeping it looking nice. Um, inspections are very important during the painting process, um, making sure that it's evenly put on, um, that the thickness is the required thickness that you, your engineer spec'd out, and just making sure it's done right to protect your investment going forward. Like I said, they should last 20 to 30 years. So if it's done right, you should be ensured that it's going to last 20 to 30 years. So having that inspection is very important when getting that tower painted. Um, bottom of the bowl is where you usually see a lot of the mold and mildew start to grow. So what we typically do is do a darker color on the bottom of the bowls. So we work with our communities as far as how the tower is going to look aesthetically wise, but add a dark color on the bottom of the bowl to help protect some of that mold because you're not going to prevent all of it, but trying to hide a little bit of it too would help. Stainless steel tanks obviously don't need any paint, but the glass fused tanks, they don't either, but steel tanks will need require paint too, and the same requirements come involved with the steel tanks as well on ground storage. Um, does Tideflex add a little back pressure to nearby part of systems when feeling, filling? There is some head loss with the Tideflex mixing system. Every time we've ran the head loss, if that's what you're asking, John, um, it's very minimal. Um, so your pumps, as far as if they're putting out 300 gallons per minute, you might see 295 or something like that, but it's a very minimal head loss in the tide flex system. Next slide. 
volume and pressure. Um, volume for communities is typically an average day demand in your water tower that you want. Some, some municipalities will go a little bit larger than that. Um, but if you're using SRF funding in the state of Iowa, they'll only fund an average day demand of what they approve. Anything above that will have to come out of the community's pocketbook um, and not out of an SRF loan. And that's something to work with on your engineer as far as if the community elects to go for a larger size water tower, then they need to bid out an alternative for the approved size so that you show the cost difference so that that money can come out of your, the community pocket rather than the SRF loan. Industrial volumes can vary. We have several industries that maybe have a quarter of their um, daily use in their ground storage tanks or elevated tanks, um, but obviously they make it up for in other areas. And larger users can vary, um, like let's say for Des Moines, Ames, obviously they don't have their full average day demand in storage, um, but that can vary between different systems. Pressure wise, um, this is what I was talking about earlier. There's some concern when you go to raise your system, even 510 PSI, your distribution system is not used to that increased pressure. Um, so raising the height of the tower to get more pressure is all fine and dandy if that's your goal, but realize there is some risk to your distribution system. So typically what we do in the one community that we raised it about 8 PSI is we also insisted that the community go through and check all their valving throughout town. So if there was a system break, they would be able to isolate that break and repair it as needed. Next slide. Aesthetics and types, um, logos can be applied to all types of tanks. On um, the glass view steel, it's usually like a sticker-like um, logo, so usually not as colorful. Um, but on the steel ones, you can easily paint those on. Um, some firms can help design logos if you don't already have one. For instance, um, you see in Cleghorn, Iowa, we assisted in them. Develop, they didn't have a logo, so they wanted something a little bit more patriotic, so they chose something like this. And our graphic designers and marketing team helped develop Cleghorn's logo that's going to be painted actually this year. So, And again, you can see the bottom of the tank we put in a darker blue color to protect from or kind of hide the mold and mildew that could grow on that. Um, in Altoona, Iowa, if you ever driven by there at night, um, their water tower, they have different lights, and they'll change different colors of lights for you know, honoring of different groups like um, essential workers, everything like that. So there's all these different options. You can look at two of your communities um, interested. A typical logo, something like Leghorns, is maybe like $4,000 to add to the paint coating. Um, it just depends how extensive you want to be on that logo and the paint system that you want to do. Lighting is a little bit different, um, depending on how you want to do it, what colors, everything like that, and what all you wanted lighted. But these all obviously come at additional cost to the tower, but it's kind of minimal and it just provides a good beacon for your community if you guys are interested in that. Next slide. Relative costs, um, a 50,000 gallon water tower. This is one we recently bid. Just the tower was 450,000. The entire project was 652, but you gotta remember when you're doing a new tower, you have demo of your existing tower. You have possibly have a mixing system to add to it. Um, water main to bring to that new water tower, valving, seating, etc. Next slide. 200,000 gallon water tower, again a single pedestal one. Um, just the tower was 550,000, but the entire project was 928 because uh, we had to change out the high service pumps. Um, again, demo of the existing water tower, mixing system. And a mixing system will typically cost you anywhere between twenty-five to fifty or twenty-five to thirty-five thousand um, dollars, but it's a good investment to keep your system um, better operationally. Next slide. And then a standpipe. This was a glass view standpipe, forty-two thousand gallons. Just the tower was around one hundred fifty thousand. So again, it's a lot cheaper cost, but the entire project in and of itself was seven hundred forty. But um, take that entire project cost into consideration. There was a lot of water main and valving and uh, different stuff we did throughout the distribution system on this project. But again, the tower may be cheaper, but you still have high pressure pumps to um, repressurize the system. You have several other costs. So again, that's something you should work with on your engineer to evaluate your best option. Next slide. Uh, that's it for me. Sean, I'll let you take over unless there's any other questions for me.
Okay, Sean, I think it's yours. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. This is, hopefully everybody can hear me. I lost my participation thing over on the left-hand side, so I don't know who's in or who's not. But I would assume there's 133 participants still who have water towers and want to talk a little bit more about water towers, so we'll proceed. Um, We'll, uh, we've got a quite a few slides to go through, but we'll uh, just see how it goes here. And again, next slide. Again, I'm on with Kale Engineering. I've been in business for a number of years. You're going to have to keep going with that. Uh, close to 40 years, if I go back to my early years looking at painting water towers as a young uh, student, I guess, of the industry. Uh, I've been at this uh, in a number of different states, about four states I haven't been into, but we'll right, keep going. Next slide. We've got to go through quite a few of these tower slides. This is an iconic slide in Iowa down at the State University there, and uh, a project that uh, does need some maintenance coming up in the near future. We'll uh, keep you posted and maybe do a full presentation on that. Next slide. Kelly covered a lot of uh, pictures of uh, different styles and types of tanks, and he covered a lot of the groundwork on that regarding it. These older legged tanks, support column type of tanks, were the times of uh, uh, evolution, I guess, and that's what they started out from the wooden towers to these types of structures, uh, but apparently uh, these have become a, quite a bit of a cost for uh, uh, repainting and maintaining them, so a lot of them have went by the wayside. Uh, a number of different features and structures like Kelly had talked about with the cross rods, the struts, the lattice legs, the handrails, they all add into the cost of the reconditioning of it. And we're going to talk about maintenance of it, but all of this one we're inspecting needs to be looked at with each and every one of these towers, interior and the exterior of it. Next slide. So those are the support column type of tanks. The next tanks are kind of the single pads. We have two single pads and two support column tanks. Uh, again, the single pads like Kelly had touched base on are a little bit cheaper to uh, paint and maintain due to the cost of the coatings material. And uh, what we're looking at on the exterior is decorative coatings on the interior, protective coatings for the, you know, keeping the steel from rusting out. And we'll, we can talk about that a little bit later on. But you can see the two uh, or the uh, two different styles of tanks that we have here. Some have handrails on the top. Some will have the balcony. Again, there's a difference in cost, and of course the designs have changed as we keep evolving here. Next slide. And we have the. Uh, uh, Ground storage tanks, whether it's above ground, uh, the one on the left is basically a standpipe. It's higher than it is uh, bigger in diameter. The one on the right is the larger diameter than it is taller. And again, they all have the basic principles, a ladder to the top, overflows, vents, manways, ladders, uh, pressure style type of manways at the base of it. Uh, concretes or underground concrete tanks or partially buried concretes are a little bit different. Uh, we usually access from the roof area of all of these with no lower areas to get in and out of them. Next slide, please. And we have the uh, hydro pillars. They've been around for a while, but usually on the bigger side, the bigger scale of things. I've seen them as small as the 250s, 200s, but most of them are usually in the 500s, uh, 750s, or larger type. Again, different uh, styles that are out there with different manufacturers that are out there. Next slide. Then we have a few more hydro pillars, again, different diameters, different styles, uh, depending on what you're going to utilize them for. Some are used for storage. I've seen some with uh, garage doors in them, uh, so big, heavy equipment can go in and out of them. And others, they don't use much for storage at all. Currently, we see a lot of them that are stored with antennas and antenna provider type of rental space with them. Next slide. Then you have the uh, composite tanks which Kelly touched base on, and again, depending on the height and the location, uh, the concrete, some are painted, some are not. Most of them, I'd say, are not coated, uh, and again, it's just decorative or aesthetics of it. Uh, and again, Kelly touched base on two-toning uh, some of these bases of these tanks. I think that's a good idea, especially on tanks that are sweating and getting dirty and so on and so forth, and he, of course, he touched base on the lettering and logo of it, but it is an icon for the community or the industry, and uh, again, uh, it usually does a good advertisement for 20 to plus years when you uh, get it selected on how you want it painted or coated. Next slide. And again, concrete tanks, they're kind of uh, buried or unburied. They uh, last a long time, but there's issues with them as well, and some of them do need some coating on the outside. We've coated some on the inside, 
you just don't coat the inside and the outside. These concretes like to gas off, and, and uh, so you either do one or the other as far as the coatings material. But it should, any of these concretes should shed water. It should not have puddled water like that other one had. So you need a pretty good sloped roof on each and every one of these. Next slide. Okay, now let's get into the little more of the meat and potatoes. The codes and standards, AWA standards, uh, you know, C662.11 talks about the definitions of inspection. We follow the 10 state standards. Iowa follows the 10 state standards as well. And then you got the, the uh, uh, Iowa Administrative Code standards out there as well. And then the, uh, the chapters are listed there. I'm not going to go through each and every detail of it, but I just want to make sure you guys were aware of that. Next slide. Then we have the uh, AWA manual uh, 42. This does get into more specific types of stuff as far as uh, uh, the examination report, the details of the report, who's qualified to do it, engineering, et cetera, et cetera. Next. Again, water towers should be inspected in not more than five year intervals. We see different uh, uh, states requiring different numbers of years looking at it. Wisconsin currently. They want the owner to assess the tank, at least the basics of the tank, every year. They want them to check for the vent screens, the overflow screens, et cetera, like that, annually. And then they've got other things every five years. They do a dry tank and a wet tank inspection on an interval every five years. In my 30 plus years of doing this, I think in tanks need to be inspected no longer than five years, but some tanks need it more often due to the sediment that's in them or other issues that they may be arising within the tank. So uh, we see a lot of tanks uh, that are inspected every year that don't need it, and we see a lot of tanks that don't get inspected for eight, nine, ten years or longer, and they needed it five, six years ago. Uh, next slide. Okay, in general, the inspection services are organizations or principals or registered professional engineers specializing in this inspection service and have at least five years experience with steel structures. Uh, what this is saying is that there's a lot of contractors and people out there that can inspect your tank, but there's no real qualifications laid out or guidelines laid out other than AWA manual. And what this is saying is you want somebody to go up there and that is going to give you some information back. And in this digital world, I still see a lot of these reports that are very vague. And when you're looking at the three to five year interval inspections, that's fine, but when you get closer to have to do some major maintenance or even some minor maintenance, you really should know what you have as far as uh, an inspection done and or uh, where you're going with the future with that tank. So it's, it's about looking what you have, identifying it, and then identifying when it would be needed in the future as far as any maintenance going up. So you want to be able to plan, budget, and do, whether it's a minor maintenance or a clean out or a pressure wash extra year, you need to have that looked at. And these types of inspections will help do that for you. Next slide. Uh, again, we're looking at the safety aspect of it. We're looking at the uh, security of it, uh, manways, vents, overflows, water quality, antennas. So when you're looking at this, you want agencies or people that are professional at this and can look at this in, uh, with experience, not just uh, uh, I was flipping burgers last week, now I'm a tank inspector this week. You want to make sure that you have some uh, quality people that are coming out to take a look at your tank and, again, put a, a substantial report together so that you can utilize that in your filing system for future references at, uh, you know, the next time it's inspected, you have some, a comparable to it. Next slide. Again, underwater storage tank inspection and cleaning guidelines are provided by Iowa DNR. They do not have such rules as far as inspection, but they do have rules for disinfection and sampling. And you guys need to be very much aware of that with any of the uh, tank inspections or dry tank cleanouts that you're doing. If uh, it's done with a diver or whether it's done a dry tank, the, the uh, disinfection and the sampling needs to be followed. Uh, you know, make sure that they're not doing anything uh, uh, short, short changing it a little bit. Make sure that they're doing all that they're supposed to be doing. Next slide. Uh, next, uh, 
So again, experienced contractors can be used, but as a courtesy, the city is encouraged but not required to provide advance notification of the proposal. So you you don't have to notify them, but the DNR would appreciate a notification of uh, you having your tank inspected. And then in Wisconsin and other places, they want you to send in a, a, a report on it. Uh, some areas are very stringent about it. Others are very much lax on it. Next. Okay, so let's talk about the inspection methods a little bit. Uh, when I started out, uh, it was in the raft and or the dry tank type of inspection. The guy in the, washing the tank out with a pressure washer there. And then uh, there's a younger picture of me with holding up paint chips. Uh, this one was about four and a half, five feet long. But uh, currently we see a lot more ROV inspections than any other type of inspection out there. Why? Because it's cost effective. We don't have to have three men like you do on a dive team. Uh, the float down is a, a slower process. We still do a fair amount of those float downs or drain it down and clean it out. But the ROV is seeing it in its natural state. How much sediment do we have in there? How often do we need to clean it? Is it up to the inlet pipe or is it all the way uh, down to the bottom? We'll show you a couple pictures on that. But these are the methods. We're just going to go over them briefly. Uh, that these are the most important things to be doing as far as inspection. Define what type of inspection you'd like to have out there. Next slide, please. Okay, so you can see in this slide there, the uh, water level is down a little bit. Uh, you can see where the inlet pipe actually is extended in this tank and the outlet pipe is actually at the bottom. But when you're looking at a tank from the picture view here, the bird's eye, there isn't a lot to do with this tank. She's in pretty good shape as far as sediment, sediment removal. Um, uh, you can see a couple potential rust spots on the tank at 12 o'clock, halfway up there. But overall, this tank is, <laughs> I drink this water, it's crystal clear, it's good looking. Uh, again, they've got a pretty easy to inspect this tank without even having to put the ROV in or to uh, drain it and clean it out. Uh, next slide. This one, however, is in a little bit dire need of inspection and work, okay? It's an old riveted tank where the bull ring, which looks like an old wheel, uh, has collapsed and fallen in. You can see daylight coming in from a number of different locations with the uh, uh, roof leaking and other problems. There's an inlet pipe and an overflow pipe at about the 12 o'clock range there. But the most importantly is the corrosion level and the biofilm that is sitting on top of this tank due to the uh, factors that have uh, lack, lack of turnover and or mixing within this tank. But anyway, this is a, you know, there's a, a good example of one that's overdue to have it inspected, looked at, and maybe totally removed. Next. Again, I started out with the float down evaluations and inspections, and basically we had to have the water at the high water level to look at the roof, the vents, the overflow, the coatings, the corrosion, uh, were things in place as far as current code. And again, this is a ground storage tank with a high dome roof in it with a diffuser plate inlet pipe. So it was aerating it as water came into it. Um, you can see that they had a high iron staining going on in the tank. Uh, they had hard water and some other stuff, but Again, this is how I inspected it originally. You had a raft, you had a radio, a pail with a report, and a magnet to hold you in place. Next slide, please. And what we did on these evaluations, inspections, is we took paint chip samples. We did pit measure readings. We did a number of different things uh, to find out if we had adhesion cohesion within the tank to find out if it's repairable or needs to be replaced. And that's part of the inspection criteria is knowing what is the age of the tank, what kind of coating system do we have, is it need fixing or is it uh, time to strip it and start all over again? Next slide, please. Uh, dive inspections got real popular for about 10 or 15 years. However, they have uh, not uh, uh, sustained as much. They really actually looked at uh, going into more ROVs. So they still do both, but the dive inspections have turned into more of clean out inspections clean out and inspections than just dive type of inspections or dive reports. There's still a fair amount of fam uh, uh, companies out there doing dives, um, but I also know that most all of them have a ROV in there, probably to go in and see how much sediment they have to know what they're going up against. 
So, but they're still out there and there's a need and a purpose for them out there as well. Next slide. On the dive zone, make sure you're using somebody who has a contained dive system, a dry suit, not a wet suit. Should be no exposed skin or uh, et cetera going into the dive. The diver should be totally encapsulated within a, a dry suit. Uh, the remote operated vehicles inspections really took off around 2000. And there's a number of different ROVs. Uh, the one on the left is one of my first ones that I've had. I've had multiple, I guess, I think we have five in stock right now. Um, great cameras, great swimming around, disinfected, fiber optic cord goes into the tank. We can see just about everything we need to see in its, in its normal active use. The one on the right is a, uh, a remote operated cleaning machine that cleans ground storage and uh, uh, concrete tanks, uh, clear wells, things of that nature. Uh, depending on the depth of sediment, these things just vacuum up the sediment without you having to drain the tank. So you, and it's all discharged outside into a, a storage area. Next. So the ROV swims around the tank. You sit in the trailer, you drive it around. You still have a guy in, uh, on the roof to drop it in, disinfect it, drop it in, and then uh, keep an eye on the tether, make sure that we're not getting tangled up into anything, old CP cords or whatever else. And basically it's a hour swim around, take a look up and down, looking for corrosion, looking for the coating conditions, look at the sediment level, any ice damage, number of different things that you're looking for with this tool in the toolkit. And uh, it's, it's the easiest, most cost-effective system out there and least dangerous system of inspecting it. No confined space, basically you're disinfecting it and pulling it out to the next job site. Uh, it will give us plenty of information to write a report and or to write specifications off it. Next slide. Again, this is actually looking at it from the crawling machine, which had cleaned this tank. We wanted to get a couple different shots of it. This is a few years ago. And taking a look at the sediment that was removed. But this machine will go anywhere in the tank. I've had it in pipelines. I've had it in a number of wet risers. Uh, it's a good tool in the toolbox to identify what we have within there. Uh, again, we do a full video, and then we do snapshot pictures of it so we can include that into the report. Next, please. This is the uh, ROV cleaning machine. And again, I've seen, uh, this is about an inch of sediment in here, not that much to clean out. It's pretty much like uh, pushing a lawnmower. It just keeps sucking it up and out of there. Uh, kind of boring for the driver after about eight hours of doing it, but some cases it uh, does uh, some pretty deep sediment and or uh, cleans up some debris as, you know, as large as a golf ball in, in some cases. Next, please. But what we're looking for, with this is when we're cleaning it and sucking this sediment out is what is the floor condition okay we can rov the rest of it we can see the floor uh in its natural state with this but what are we actually looking for well we're looking for construction joints and next slide please and we're looking for uh cracking within the floor so here's here's an example of a crack that probably wasn't identified because of the, the way the sediment was within this tank but that's what we're looking for is do we have any leakage you have a permissible leak rate with the tanks, you just can't leak into a concrete tank. But uh, this is what we're looking for when we're inspecting it, not only removing the sediment uh, in its natural state and not kicking up turbidity spikes, but we're looking for uh, dysfunctional features within the tank. Next, please. And again, the old dry tank inspection was a uh, uh, method that was used for numbers of years before the float down came into effect. And again, you basically drain the tank, uh, rinse it out, clean it out. If there's any debris that needs to be removed, uh, re-disinfect it and put it back in service. The, there's advantages and disadvantages of each and every one of these methods. It's a matter of what the owner would like to see. But like I said, 80, 90 percent of them are all being done with an ROV inspection versus the dry tank inspection. Dry tanks are fine if you've got a lot of sediment and, and issues with them in the elevated tanks. Uh, but overall, the ROV has become more popular for a number of different reasons, uh, especially for uh, the inspection and the, the quality of the cameras that are out there for taking these pictures for the reports and stuff. Next, please. 
So during a dry tank cleanout, sometimes you get into some pretty nasties. And uh, over the years, we still find some that don't get cleaned out on a regular basis or they have some issues with uh, filtration or no backwash system or whatever it might be. So some tanks are required to be cleaned out more often than not. Uh, some are very clean, like that first one I showed you. Uh, these get to be real soupy and get to be a job uh, trying to remove all this uh, debris out of here. Next, please. Again, when you've got it up to the inlet outlet pipe, the top of it, we've got a problem because now it's, it's doing what it's doing right now in natural state. It's first in, first out, and when your level is up to the top of the inlet pipe, uh, it's time to drain clean and get that material out of there. Again, it can be real soupy or it can be really hard sand. A number of different types of materials we find within these tanks. And, and that's what we call it, material. We don't, we don't even want to know what's in it. We just want to clean it out. Typically, they have no real odor to them, but uh, we do need to get them removed when they're that full. Next slide, please. So here's the picture of it uh, after it was cleaned out. And you can see how deep the, the sediment level was within that tank. The first time we looked at this tank, it had been 10 years, and we had drained and cleaned it. It was full of sludge like that. We said, you know, we better look at this sooner than five years or no later than five years. Well, at the five-year mark, it was still that full. We went to the three-year mark on cleaning this, and that was the magic number of it was still below the, the fill pipeline. One of the other things we could have done is, and we've done it in many other ones that are lower than this, is elevated that inlet pipe another 6 to 12 inches so that we don't have to worry about that issue near as much. But uh, normally uh, get into an inspection or a clean-out plan or program and then figure out the best way to remove the sediment, whether it's a drain clean-out valve or a plug or uh, some other method of removing the debris out of there. Next, please. Hey, Sean, looks like we're running just over. Okay, it. watch my time here. Yeah, so we're once fine. We're done, Sean, we'll you can them. take your time on that. You can take your time. We'll uh, compensate with the other presentations. Yeah, I forgot okay. to start my timer. I got like eight minutes. I've been at the to start my and timer. And just while we're talking, uh, Sean, uh, we had one question. Your thoughts on communication antennas on water towers. Yep. You know, it's a good revenue source for communities, but it basically comes down to how they're installed. Do you want to hit on that real quick? Yeah, uh, the antennas start with the contract. And when we're serious with antenna providers, uh, Usually we ask the city, before they even look at the, get going in with the contract, we ask them to get an escrow fund set up, okay? These providers will will send you a fifteen twenty thousand dollars $20,000 check to put in an escrow fund to use to pay for the review for the attorney, the review for the city, the review for the engineer. Once that has been approved and you enter into a contract, now you're looking at, uh, looking at drawings and submittals that need to come in and approval, and those need to go to the engineer for approval. All of this is no cost to the city. The, and the antenna providers need to, to uh, pony up and do the cost for it due to the federal communication rule. So it's a pass-through cost for the city, but the city is the controller of it because it's going on their water tower. So when you're looking at a water tower, you're looking at rental space and how much space for their building, their structure, what's the routing going to be, what's the space on the roof or the location it's going to be at. And do we need a larger uh, um, handrail or not? But what we see mostly is that they're installed uh, with issues, OSHA issues or other types of issues that are going to impede the painting process or the maintenance process of the tower. So that's why you get your engineer involved with it so that we make sure that it's getting uh, proper routing and, and locations and penetrations and make sure that they're not just hacking it and throwing it up on top of the water tower. And again, it's first and foremost a water tower, not an antenna stand. If the city wants to generate and make some revenue off of it, go for it. I highly recommend uh, that it stays in the water tower maintenance fund, okay, so that you can take care of some of the touch-ups or the clean-outs or inspections that are done with it. It typically goes in the general fund and you lose control over it, but it's a headache for a lot of these water operators because of people coming and going and who's got keys, who doesn't have keys. So it's a security thing as well. But I would say that for the most part, it's, a, it's your control. Take control over it. Don't let them have it. Uh, keep a, keep a, them under, you know, the watchful eye of yourself. So is that it? What, is that answer's question, Kelly? I went over to kind of general brief. 
Nope, I think you're good there. Yeah, but you know, make sure your contract is written properly, especially when you got to do the re-maintenance of it. We see people try to work it around these, and they're dangerous. Uh, we like to see contracts where they move them, remove them entirely, and then reinstall them. Uh, and they usually, at that point, they're doing some upgrades on them anyway. So, okay, uh, how much time I got? I got like I don't even know how many slides I got left. Yeah, I don't have that many. Well, I do have a few slides. Next. So inspection reports should include all of these items here. Uh, I would say the most important thing is the schedule for maintenance of this. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, I think engineering cost estimate is important too, especially when you're at that 20 to 25 year mark where you're going to have to do some major maintenance. Um, currently, we see the coatings uh, put on today. We're going to easily get 20 to 25 years, if not 30 years, out of the current coatings that we're applying in the system we have. The coatings in the future are changing. They're getting uh, less and less VOCs. We're seeing high, uh, high percentage of solids. Again, I think that has to do with a, a number of different things as far as the water quality and other issues that are out there. Uh, next slide, please. So again, here is a typical tank that was inspected, but nothing was done with it. By the time we got back into it 10 years later, that roof rafter area was completely corroded out. They didn't take the advice and take the painting seriously when it needed it. They ended up having to put all new rafters and a new bull ring in there uh, for that center support column to continue holding up that roof. Just an example of something that if there's something in your report that says do it, don't put it off. Don't kick that can down the road too long. Next. Again, owner's responsibilities, uh, provide, you know, uh, drawings, make sure you got the keys for the roof and they're the keys. If you need to change them out or cut them off, that's the last thing we hate to do. Uh, we'd like to see the previous reports and any uh, old uh, type of specs. And again, make sure your reservoir is secure. At the end of the day, we, we like to take pictures of it and make sure that we're, we're the last ones there. It's locked. Next. Uh, inspection fees depend on what you're looking for as an inspection. Again, you can have the full-blown inspection, which means uh, paint chip samples, testing for lead, chromium, other issues. We're looking at a number of different things as far as types of reports. But if you're going into a reconditioning, you probably want to get the most thorough documentation you can so that you don't have change orders going on with your repaint project. And again, remember, you, you, you get what you're paying for. So it's a little more expensive, but you probably save it in the long run. Next. Again, the evaluation report recommendations, they, they help everybody, the owner, the engineer, inspector, contractor, material supplier. It's a teamwork effort when you're going into doing these types of uh, projects. And again, this is a major asset within your community. You have to uh, take it seriously on, on the inspections of it. Next. Uh, next. <laughs> I just threw that one in there. It was kind of a, everybody knows where that tower is at. Again, routine maintenance, no more than five years. Uh, complete reconditionings we see in the interior and exterior, usually uh, including containment in the 20 to 25 year mark. Uh, spot repairs sometimes at the 12 to 16 year mark. The power washing in, as needed and, and then the warranty repairs. Make sure you do your warranties within that warranty period of one to two years, whatever your warranty inspection is. Next. Uh, complete reconditioning, we're following all of these guidelines, but the, again, we're consultants, we're looking at the owner's benefits uh, as far as why we would do it this way, okay? We give plenty of options out there, but there's specific reasons for active or passive mixing, et cetera, antenna installation, uh, pre-installation type of stuff. Next. Again, interior structural modifications, we're looking at a lot of things that are uh, trying to make this tank survive the 100 to 150 year mark. We've, we've got a lot of tanks that are over 100 years old, and the reason they're not is they weren't properly maintained originally. But the way we're putting coating systems on and the, the type of coatings and the contractors we have, there's no reason we can't get uh, 20, 25, 30 years out of the next paint job. Next. All right, and that I will ask Kelly if there's any further questions, and if you want to go to one more slide just for the fun of it, you can. Maybe you took that one out. Yeah, so in wrap-up, 
have a have it properly inspected and have it done in a timely manner don't put it off too long uh, make sure you're doing it within five years so that you have current documentation going forward with your uh, your inspection so it's a baseline report and then it's the next baseline report etc cetera, etc cetera. kelly questions i don't see any other sean thanks for presenting um isg and klm work together when we're doing water towers uh, klm helps with our inspection services on that so if you want to get in contact with isg um i think on the email invite for this presentation there was communication numbers on their emails and phone number um and we can also get you in contact with sean too if it's an inspection question too so um, i think our next presenter is chad irvine so first we're going to take a 10 minute break. So we will start back at 1020. For those of you who did not put your name in when you signed in, if you just see a phone number, please email us your phone number and your name so we can make sure you get credit for attending today. We don't have phone number and name cross references. So to get your CUs, you need to provide us the name that goes with the phone number, please. We'll Appreciate see you back you. in 10 minutes. Appreciate your help, Kelly. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. All right, we're going to resume the presentation. So I'll introduce myself. My name's Chad Irvin. I work for ISG. I've been with ISG for two years now. Um, I've got around 20 years of experience in process controls uh, in a different capacities. Uh, I've worked for integrators. I worked for electrical contractor. Um, I've also worked for a couple different companies in the food industry and also um, along with the food industry had some maintenance roles in there. So got a, a diverse background there but primarily the focus has been on electrical controls. So we're going to take you through control systems, Ethernet connectivity, and the increasing role of the Internet. The first area that we're going to talk about is Ethernet controlled motors. So why use Ethernet based motor control over traditional methods? Uh, most contractors, I'll tell you, love Ethernet and we really can't blame them. There's fewer physical connections. There's less chance for error from analog signals, and there's more information which allows you to improve the process operation. So really Ethernet has many advantages, but we really need to look at is it, is it right for all situations. And just because it's, it's easy for a contractor to install and makes their job easier, doesn't necessarily mean it's the right solution for every application. So let's look at the traditional motor control configuration. So here we've got a picture of a, a older PLC um, and to the right there we show a motor control center. So typically in this scenario for traditional connection, you're going to have individual wires that need to route between the PLC panel and your motor control center or wherever, if you've got VFDs that are mounted on the wall, that would be the same situation. So there's, in this case, we've got individual wires and let's look at uh, if we're going to energize a motor starter. Typically, you're going to have four wires <clears throat> per across the line starter or soft starter. You'd have four to six wires and two shielded cables per variable speed drive. So in this scenario, we would easily have 86 plus wires and 16 cables that would be needed between the PLC and this, this MCC. So that's, that's a lot of connections, that's a lot to keep track of. When we look at Ethernet, <clears throat> in an MCC scenario, all that control can be done with one or two cables. 
So we've just got a single communication cable from the programmable automation controller, PAC or PLC, and that is going to do everything that you need. That's one cable to the MCC for all those devices, or if you've got wall-mounted drives that are not in an MCC, you're going to have one cable per VFD. And there are some different scenarios um, that we can get into where you can reduce that number, and we'll talk about some of those different um, network topologies a little bit later. So some advantages of the Ethernet motor control, from an installation standpoint, it's going to be much quicker. So there's going to be some time and labor savings there. There's less cables and wiring installed. You've got improved process operations due to additional information from the motor controller. So under the traditional methods, as most of you probably know, you're just really turning something on and, and you get a signal back that it's running. And really all you know is that if it's a starter, you know, hey, I told the starter to turn on and I know the starter is engaged. But do you really know if your motor is running? In this case with Ethernet, there's all kinds of diagnostic information that you can get back that will help you know if your motor's running or if you've got a potential problem. So a few things that um, I've listed here that are available, um, overload, phase loss, stall, jam, ground fault, underload, a current imbalance. It will keep track of the number of starts, operating hours, the voltage that you're currently operating at, the current that the motor is drawing, frequency, trip history, if there's warnings in there if you're nearing overload. So there's there's just all kinds of information um, and that's, that's on across the line starters or variable frequency drives. So that allows you to have some predictive maintenance opportunities that you can set up in your control system. Um, you can help warn if you've got an, an issue going on. You can also track some of those items over a period of time, and you could build a trend to help understand, you know, if I've got a, a pump that has always operated at a certain amp draw, and now over the last year I've seen that it's, it's increased, gradually been increasing, that may trigger that there's a potential problem. So one of the things um, that I, I just want to emphasize here is the ability to verify a motor is running based on actual, actual amp draw. So kind of curious if anyone's ever had a bad day because a disconnect was left off. Uh, maybe they were working on something, left it off. I know this has happened to me before. And uh, the disconnect's off, and you put everything back to normal. However, the disconnect's still off. The control system doesn't know that. It goes on its merry way, running like everything's normal, and then you, all of a sudden you got major problems. Maybe you go home for the day, and uh, you might get a call later on that you got some major issues because you, you thought everything was fine, but uh, you know, the disconnect was off. So in this case with Ethernet, you can monitor the actual amp draw of the motor, and that's going to allow you to know, is that motor really running? And uh, and that's really a foolproof way to, to know that the motor's actually doing what it's supposed to. Some disadvantages of Ethernet motor control. Um, due to the nature of the beast with the networking and you know having one or two cables connected in a network, if, if you lose that cable, or a certain network device, you could have multiple motors that are now down and not working. So if your network's down, not, not such a good thing. Um, the other thing is uh, troubleshooting can require a higher skill level. You know, traditionally with the traditional motor control <clears throat> um, 
you'd have an electrician or maybe somebody on staff that with a voltmeter could be able to tell readings, you know, and do some troubleshooting and know, hey, is the is a system telling the starter to run and you could go to from point A to point B with a voltmeter and verify that you have voltage. With Ethernet, it's not so simple. Um, a lot of it's more internal diagnostics, you know, it comes down to is it a is it a programming issue or is it a cabling issue? And there's just much different ways they have to go about troubleshooting uh, an Ethernet problem. Um, one of the other disadvantages of the Ethernet motor control is th there's a little bit of increased cost for the motor controller device itself. And it's dependent on the configuration that you go with, but if you're just having a, a wall-mounted drive, it's not going to be much increased cost to, to have an Ethernet functionality with that drive. And a lot of the drives are coming standard with Ethernet on board. If you're in an MCC lineup, that's where the cost can get a little bit higher. And there's several different options there. There's MCCs that can come uh, essentially pre assembled from the manufacturer with the Ethernet cables installed and some Ethernet switches installed. And those those are like a pre-engineered solution. And they're really nice and they're pre-tested, but you also pay a premium for that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, com again, component replacement may require a controls engineer level person. So. In an example here, um, let's say that you've got an Ethernet system and you've got a two-year-old VFD that fails and needs to be replaced. So you purchase a drive, you get it replaced, and you just expect, well, I should just be able to plug the Ethernet cable back in and everything should work. However, that's not always necessarily going to be the case. If the newer drive has a higher firmware, which it most definitely will with all the, the changing technology, it's likely going to have a newer firmware, It may, which may mean that it's got a few different parameters than the previous version drive had. And now you've got a conflict between your drive and what the control system is expecting to see. And in order to resolve that and to get that to function properly, somebody may have to get online with your PLC program and make some updates to make that work. I will note that there, there is an automatic device configuration for some devices. And, and in this, I'm just speaking in terms of Allen Bradley or, or Rockwell Automation products. I know that they have a some software tools that can be set up in the beginning that can help with that configuration and they advertise that that's um, basically will eliminate this problem that I just talked about where um, needing a controls engineer to get involved. Supposedly this, I, I haven't experienced it myself, but supposedly it will keep things up to date and allow you to just plug and play with your uh, device replacement. Um, another potential item where you'd need a controls engineer is an Ethernet switch replacement. Um, again, it, a lot of it is dependent on how well things are set up on the front side um, by the controls contractor. And if they've done things, if they've done a good job, they, they can make this really easy. There's uh, thumb drives that can have the configuration on it, but a lot of times the Ethernet switch that you're going to be using is going to have some type of special configuration inside it. It's not necessarily going to be something that's just off the shelf that you just buy and power up and plug in and away you go. A lot of times there's some modifications uh, to the program of the switch, but like I said, that can be loaded via thumb drive and there's some other methods that are typically available. So that's just another thing to note. There's definitely a plan there on, you know, what happens if this Ethernet switch fails, how do I get it back up and going? And 
and a lot of times <clears throat> you don't want to rely on calling somebody in uh, to get that back up and going. The other thing is network systems should be evaluated and maintained regularly by qualified staff. So it's not a set and forget, and that's something I'm going to really emphasize throughout this, is with the changes that we've had in technology really over the last 15 to 20 years, there's, <clears throat> there's so much involvement with networks, so much involvement with the Internet and with computers. And because those systems are continually changing, and a lot of that is to deal with security, the, the network systems and the control systems need to be looked at on a regular basis. It's really no longer safe to just install the control system and just forget about it. <clears throat> Some considerations for Ethernet controlled motors. Uh, the, there is some distance limitations that we have to think about. Um, typically, uh, they, all they require is a Cat5 cable. However, that, that Cat5e cable is limited to 328 feet. So if you have a great distance from your control system greater than that, fiber optic cable can be used. The other consideration is having un uninterruptible power supply, and a lot of times those will be on key network switches. So if you've ever had to restart power like on your home router or if you've lost power at the office or whatever it might be, you might notice that it takes a little while for those network switches to boot back up, and that would be the same situation here. But a lot of times, you know, if you, if you lose power, and uh, things are starting back up, you may not want to wait for that network switch to reload. So a lot of times having it on battery backups is um, going to be the best. <clears throat> and, and also it's, it's just hard on equipment. If equipment's shutting off and having to turn back on, it just increases the risk that there, there may be a problem with and it may not start up as you expected. Another thing is a backup plan. <clears throat> so we need to think about how critical are the motors in the process, and that will lead into what kind of means do we have for backup is just having a handoff auto selector switch somewhere for that motor good enough, or do I need some hardwired auto override to automatically control if my Ethernet goes down? And that kind of plays into the network architecture. There's different options for how the Ethernet network will be laid out and the level of redundancy that's needed there. So for motor control backup plan, you know, what if, what if that network's down, what's your plan B? So thinking about can the equipment be operated manually until repairs are made? And that's going to just vary case to case. Is that an hour until it could be repaired? Is it half a day? Is it two days? So how long could you operate something manually? And then thinking about who's qualified to troubleshoot and help do those repairs. Do you have somebody in-house or do you have some in-house talent that you could send to some additional training or do you have a good contractor that's reliable and can respond in a timely manner. And then the other point is hardwired backup control may be necessary. Um, one of the situations that I can think of this as necessary is with a critical pumping station at a, at a lift station. So if you've got a, a critical lift station um, and you know that it can't be down for an excessive amount of time, uh, it may be connected to Ethernet, but then there may need to be a backup means to operate it. So you don't want to have somebody standing there for hours on end looking at the level of the, the wet well and then manually turning on pumps. We talked about network architecture. I, I won't go into a lot of details on this, but in the picture here, there's just some different pictures of common networks and they're really just showing how devices are are connected that's what the circles are if they're 
in a line or um, a ring is is a common one that's referred to in the control world and you can see the picture there where it makes a complete circle and the ring helps provide a level of redundancy so we'll kind of look at here a typical Allen Bradley centerline MCC that would come equipped with an Ethernet IP network so on the left side we show a linear topology where the MCC section has got a switch installed in this first section, section one, and that's connected to several devices between section one and section two. You'll see the next section over has also has a switch, and those two are connected together by a cable. Those have to get back to the PLC somehow, so looking back, there's another switch and then a connection to the, the PLC. So in this linear topology, if a connection breaks or if one of those switches at the beginning, like say right by the PLC fails, that is going to be a big problem and you're going to lose communication to everything downstream of that. With the switch level ring, which is offered by Alan Bradley, they just basically add another cable and make a circle. And I don't show, it doesn't show on this illustration, but we just imagine that there's another switch device up ahead of the dash line. So essentially, as I showed here, a ring, those switches are installed in a circular formation. So if one switch or one cable fails, traffic can be routed in the opposite direction. So we'll look at this a little bit further. So the, the DLR network option is called device level ring, and that's what we were just talking about. This is another example of how that's connected, say, to some wall-mounted drives. And in this example, we've got a compact logic controller with two, let's just say, wall-mounted 520 series drives. So they show an Ethernet cable coming out of the PLC, and then it heads to the right. It connects to the drive, and the drive will have two port, two Ethernet ports on it, one in, one out for the next drive. So in this configuration, on the left, if where the X is, let's say that cable connection fails, theoretically everything will stay operational. To the right, another example, let's say for whatever reason the drive shut off or failed, theoretically the other devices on that network would stay in operation. So this is a, a good option for um, critical equipment that needs to stay running. So Ethernet motor conclusion. Uh, Ethernet controlled motors have many advantages over traditional motor control methods. In food industry, along with many other industries, have been using Ethernet and other network-based motor controls for a long time. And the one thing about those facilities is a lot of those facilities have technicians and engineering staff to help maintain those systems and resolve issues. So that's that's always a consideration, and it's it's not to say that you're just because you install Ethernet, you're going to have issues, but it's nice to have that staff close by if there is an issue that it can be dealt with quickly. Um, size of operation, process complexity, and internal and ex external resources should be considered before selecting Ethernet motor control at your facility. So the next session that we'll get into will be Ethernet controlled instruments. So why use Ethernet to monitor control instruments versus traditional methods? And you'll see a lot of similarities here between the motor control center. So like Ethernet controlled motors, again, control contractors, they love Ethernet connected instruments. Again, there's 
fewer physical connections, not quite as much as you'll see on a motor control center. But the main thing is there's less chance for error from analog signals, and there's more information, again, to improve process operation. So one of the big things with the, uh, and the traditional methods of wiring, when you've got an analog device, typically they're transmitting a 4 to 20 milliamp signal, and that signal has to be scaled at both ends. So let's say you have a flow meter. The flow meter has to be configured to output 4 to 20 milliamps based on a certain flow. So that has to be programmed into the flow meter. Let's say it's 0 to 300 gallons per minute. Then on the receiving device end, like a PLC, that also has to be configured to receive that same signal. And then you also have, are going to have a percentage of error depending on the distance or other ish, noise potential issues in the area that can affect that signal. So usually you're never going to get the exact signal in 100% accuracy from your device back to your system. Ethernet, you're going to get the exact with 100% accuracy. So traditional instrument connection, um, a lot of these devices, flow meters, conductivity, um, other analytical sensors, um, dissolved oxygen, total solids, those type of devices typically take one to two cables and head back to the PLC. And usually it's a, a two-wire cable signal to send 4 to 20 milliamps. So individual cables, the, um, they're typically shielded. Um, if we look at like an actuator, which we have a picture of there, um, a lot of times they take a lot more. There likely is going to be two shielded cables. Um, if it's going to be one that can be commanded to various positions, one's, one of those cables is going to operate the position, the other one's for feedback, and then you may have six to ten wires as well just for monitoring and other controls of that actuator. When we use Ethernet, we just have one cable, so it really simplifies that. Single cable to each device. So again, improved process operations and increased accuracy, like we talked about. So for example, from a flow meter, you've got flow total, flow rate, process media temperature. Those are common things that can be transmitted from the flow meter just over the single cable. There's advanced process troubleshooting. Um, and I'll, I'll give an example um, that I had dealt with at one time with entrained air in a process. So I had a flow meter that was in question and it was in a new application. And so, you know, we're thinking, well, the flow meter should be accurate but we just were not getting the flow readings that we were expecting. So we were able to use the Ethernet connection and pull out diagnostic information out of the flow meter in real time that indicated really how, how hard the flow meter was really working to get a signal, um, which really equated to how much entrained air was in the process. And we were able to determine that there was, in fact, a high amount of entrained air in the process, and that's what was affecting the meter accuracy. So there was nothing wrong with the meter, but without having the Ethernet connection, it would have been almost impossible to, to get that figured out. Uh, control valve actuator, um, so you know, common open, close, stop commands, desired position, is the selector, if you have a local selector, is that in remote, is it in local? Is it running? What's the position? That's a thermostat tripped. So especially with these devices, there's so many things to monitor, and it takes a lot of wires if you're doing traditional method where Ethernet is just one cable. Some disadvantages. Um, again, a network failure could result in multiple instruments being down. That instrument replacement may require a controls engineer um, to help get it back online and working if you got to replace something. 
Again, the troubleshooting requires a little bit higher skill level. You know, it kind of goes back to the same thing we talked about with motor control centers where you, you kind of cut out the need for somebody to have a multimeter or voltmeter and and trying to troubleshoot signals here, it's it's really kind of blind. You're not really seeing what's being passed. What makes it a little bit more difficult. In with the Ethernet on these options for instruments, you're usually going to pay a little bit more to get Ethernet on these devices. But as the demand keeps increasing, um, the price seems to continue to go down, and they become more and more reasonable. So. Um, again, some considerations, same thing, uh, Cat5 cable, it's limited to 328 feet. This is probably one of the biggest factors because in most cases you're not going to run fiber out to your device. It's just, it starts to become not feasible. Most of the devices are not set up to accept fiber. Um, so really the device needs to be, or your instrument, I should say, needs to be within 320 feet of uh, where the connection is going to be at the control system. Same thing with having a UPS for network switches. Um, we want to keep those on at all the time. We don't want them shutting off. And then just something to think about is how, how critical is that particular instrument to the operation and it, what's the backup plan if communication is lost. And a lot of times the, the instruments are not near as critical as your motor applications Usually you can live without an instrument um, for a period of time, but um, there's always an application or two that has something that's really critical. So just something to think about how what how's that impact the control system if communication's lost. And and then you know what's what is that that backup plan and you know some of those like we talked about flow meter, dissolved oxygen oxygen, total solids, chlorine, pH. And who is qualified to troubleshoot? Again, is there somebody in-house, or do you have a contractor that you're going to have to call? So in conclusion, Ethernet-connected instruments have many advantages over traditional connected devices. Many industries have been taking advantage of the Ethernet-connected instruments for years, and we see the demand for Ethernet-connected devices to continue to increase. And having qualified staff or a reliable contractor to maintain the control system and troubleshoot is really important. Again, the size of operation, process, process complexity, and internal and external resources should be considered before selecting Ethernet connected instruments. <clears throat> so the next area we're going to dive into is the industrial internet of things, which this has been a hot buzz topic for the last at least 15 years and continues to grow and change. It's a really a hard thing to really keep up on. So we'll touch base on it here. So internet of things, IOT or industrial internet of things, IIoT is really it's the inner connection via the internet of computing devices embedded in everyday objects. So the inner connection via the internet of computing devices embedded in everyday objects. And it is enabling them to send and receive data. The International Data Corporation predicts 150 billion IoT devices will create 90 trillion gigabytes of data by 2025. That's just a massive amount of data. So all the sectors are trying to understand how they can capitalize on the information. So some of them, you know, manufacturing, telecoms, healthcare, financial services, retail, government, energy, water, wastewater, and education. Those are just a few of the many sectors that are trying to figure out how can they capitalize on this information. Another um, technology piece that's becoming more prominent is low power wide area networks. So they're predicting that this is gonna change the IoT landscape. These 
This network is designed to send and receive small amounts of data over long distance on an hourly or daily basis and, and do it without really consuming much power. So more, they're predicting that more than half the 80 billion IoT devices in use by 2030 will, will utilize the LP WAN. So here's kind of a diagram of the Internet of Things. Um, just to kind of talk about some of the different applications. Um, from a consumer standpoint, I'm sure many of you have seen these and can really kind of think about how this is used at home or in the office and can kind of think about how it could lead into the industry. So if you've got a programmable thermostat that falls under an IoT device, a smart appliance, you know, we've got lots of things in the home. There's the doorbell now that's got camera on it connected to the internet. Um, there's, you know, garage door openers are another one. I know I, I replaced my garage door a couple years ago and I could get one with Wi-Fi on it. And I thought, why do I need Wi-Fi on my garage door? So I didn't get it. And then Two months later, I'm wondering if I shut my garage door after I drove to work and I was wishing I had it. So there's there's big advantages to those devices and they're, they're I would say they're utilizing them more on the consumer side, but the industrial side is really trying to ramp up to see how they can benefit. So we'll kind of go through um, some possible different uses. So an example for wastewater, um, Cando is a company. They've installed some monitoring systems in underground sewers in the US, Europe, and Israel, and Australia. They've used this to monitor upstream wastewater, and they've used industrial IoT sensing units, including automated samplers and that sends data to a central analytics engine, which then identifies abnormalities and tracks events to their source, generating automatic predictions and alerts. The system can help utilities monitor the pollution status of a city and work with the largest polluters to reduce illegal discharges and prepare wastewater treatment plant to deal with excessive load. So that's one example. In Really with this, the where they're monitoring multiple locations, may, let's just say it's a large city and they, have a, they already have a control system and a SCADA system with a computer at their plant, but to connect devices all across the city back to their SCADA system, the cost could be astronomical. So in a case like this, using the IoT, they really just need Wi-Fi connection back to the internet, and they can get the they can get the data out that way and send it to a separate search search engine. It's not on their control network, so they don't have to worry about as many security issues that way, and they can do the installation for much less. IoT and water. <clears throat> so in this example, they're utilizing. The Internet of Things, predictive analytics, and optimization techniques. So they deploy level sensors and reservoir and overhead storage tanks and transmit levels to a central server where data is stored. They utilize the data for predictive analytics to forecast water demand based on historical usage for that particular day. So a pump schedule could be generated to determine how much water is required for the next day based on existing inventory and historical demand. Uh, it could take into consideration energy prices if those change throughout the day, or maybe your facility is built based off of peak demand load and you want to minimize your peak demand the pumps could be scheduled at different times of the day to try to save money on your energy bill. Inventory control is another example. Uh, level sensors can be deployed 
in chemical tanks, lime storage tanks, et cetera, whatever it might be that you're purchasing and storing on a regular basis. That information, when connected out to the internet, can go to a server. Typically, it's going to be of your material provider. That material provider then can schedule automatic deliveries based on your inventory levels, and they can also monitor historical usage and warn of abnormal usage. Um, in an example where I've seen this used, um, it was in a boiler application where water was being treated with chemical um, for the boiler makeup and for some other mechanical systems. And the, the basically it was the chemical supplier was monitoring the, the water consumption via flow meters and the chemical consumption, and they would monitor that remotely, and they could provide a report back. And they had all the historical information. It was really handy. They would Each month, they could give a report, and you could see the trend if your usage was up or down, um, what, what the water usage was, and they could detect an anomaly that same day and let you know if they saw usage spike up for some reason or go way down, you could get notified of an issue. It's pretty slick. <clears throat> um, another system, um, Endress Hauser has a Netalliance smart system. This is one that's been used more over in Europe, but <clears throat> it's really just a wireless transmitter that's measuring temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, and conductivity. And they're putting these on surface water applications where they want to verify what the water quality is. Uh, this information then can be displayed by the user on their smart on their smartphone or smart device. They can get real-time readings and receive alarm notifications of what's going on. Alarm monitoring, this is another one that's really changed over the years. So you know, the days of using an analog phone line are really kind of over, especially for alarms. And so more of the alarm systems are being connected to the Internet uh, or to cellular or just with Internet and cellular backup. But ultimately, a lot of them are cloud-based, and they're really fairly inexpensive and can provide those uh, alarm notifications to your um, to your smartphone via email or text or even voice. So cyber security. Next, we'll get into cyber security. So the first thing, 100% risk mitigation from cyber attacks is not possible. It's just, it's just not. There's. You could spend all the money in the world you wanted to try to prevent an attack, and you're never going to get there. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do anything. So there's there's a lot of things that we can do to help mitigate the risk and set us up in a good situation. There's And there's internal and external threats a lot of times. Um, for me, anyways, I think more about external threats when I think about cybersecurity but we also need to look at internal. Um, you know, not all threats come from a hacker in China or Ukraine or wherever living off potato chips and energy drinks. So according to um, Waterfall Security Solutions, the this was in 2018, I think, the top industrial cyber attacks. So the top four attacks, number one was a disgruntled control system insider. So somebody that had access to the control system, maybe they were a programmer, but had intimate knowledge of the system. So internal attack. Second one, again, is an internal attack, a disgruntled IT insider. The third one was common ransomware, typically downloaded by accident when searching for information. So it could be somebody that was trying to download updates or certain files for their control system, 
and they accidentally downloaded something that had ransomware in it, not knowing. The fourth one was targeted ransomware, where basically the the hacker, the person that is doing the targeting, gets specific information about the company and who works there and what their roles are, and they target those people, and they target them with phishing attacks. So they start sending them emails and doing different things, trying to get them to click on a link or open something, and that's how they can infect the system then with ransomware. So ransomware, it's a type of malicious software designed to block access to computer systems until a sum of money is paid. So let's look at the industrial Internet of Things and motor control instrument connections. We'll kind of touch on these and kind of where they're at and how they fall into the security of things. So typically the devices that are used for the Internet of Things are connected directly to the Internet and they're not routed back through the control system. So there is security that's required for those devices, but usually it's not near as critical as your control system because typically you're just getting information uh, from, from those IoT devices and we're not really relying on them to do a lot of control. It's just monitoring and it's for information purposes. So if something went down with it, it's not ultra critical. The motor control and instruments over Ethernet, you may wonder, well, how secure are those if they're using Ethernet? And in this diagram, we can we show the hierarchy of the network levels and le between level zero and one is really the devices and your so your sensors, your VFDs, your PLC, those devices reside between that level and that does not have internet. We never want internet access down at that level. So when we talk about having motors and instruments controlled over ethernet, they're on their own dedicated network isolated from the internet. As we move up the chain, at some point you do have um, the PLC and, and or operator interface that's gonna need some type of access to the internet and, and then that's gonna be protected by our firewall. So let's talk about remote access over the internet. So the type of remote access that's desired, commonly, you, if you've got a, an updated control system, remote support from the control system contractor is gonna be pretty typical and it just makes their job easier. It's gonna save you money and time and waiting. So if you do have an issue, this is um, really advantageous to have that remote support over the internet for a controls integrator to monitor and make adjustments. And, and typically this is a different, it's really a different type of connection um, than Say you might have if you if you want to view things remotely as an operator, it's different. So you may you may think, well, you know, I want remote access to view things from home or wherever it might be, and your controls contractor might tell you, well, you're not really set up for that. And and at the same time, they can get in remotely and do things, and you may wonder, well, why is that? Well, it's really two separate connections, and and how. How the, and what they're doing um, to modify the PLC programs and the HMI programs versus remote viewing of screens. So the, the second piece there is remote operator screen access. And so at the beginning of a project, it's critical to understand where do you want to view from. If you, if you do need remote access, is that going to be from an on-site computer at your site? Is it going to be from on-site smartphones or tablets? Or do you need to view things from an off-site computer or off-site smartphones or tablets? So it's really important up front if you're doing a new project or making changes to have these conversations uh, to understand what you need to make sure you, you, you get the right things in your control system. 
So let's look at standalone HMI terminals. Standalone HMI terminal stations such as Allen Bradley, Panelview Plus 7, or Maple Systems are commonly used. And we see these because of low cost, ease of installation, and ease of maintenance. And the nice thing about these, typically they have a option to use VNC, so virtual network computing. And here we show a diagram where you can take control from one of these HMI units to another and easily view what's on that one. So that's pretty simple. It's really low cost. As long as the, those two devices are on the same network, you can uh, view what's going on from that remote location. If you need to connect from other devices, further design and security considerations are required. So again, are you connecting through local business network or through a dedicated control networks? And every situation is different, but again, there are conversations that need to be had up front to ensure the proper infrastructure setup and security. Off-site remote access. Some standalone HMIs have optional software that allows remote viewing via web browser or special app on a smart device. So like the Allen Bradley has their Panel View Plus 7 series that uses uh, an optional factory talk viewpoint which can publish things to uh, basically pub to a web view. One thing I've noticed that the Allen Bradley latest Panel View 5000 series does not offer that. So that kind of tells me that they're, they're going to phase that out. There hasn't been enough demand for it or they're going to come up with something, something else for that solution. Maple Systems is another brand. They use uh, Easy Access 2.0, is what they call it, for their smart device app viewing. So really remote viewing options and security solutions incorporated into the device vary from HMI manufacturer. Just because the HMI can publish information for remote viewing doesn't mean it will be secure over the internet. So oftentimes additional security considerations are needed. The other way to view things as a server client HMI system, typically for your larger systems, you're gonna have a server client where you've got a central server and that distributes information to other devices like on-site desktop computers or tablets or thin clients and smartphones. That server client configuration is much more powerful and typically has some type of remote access option available. Typically, the system will allow connection from a web browser as well or, or a special application on a smart device or standalone HMI to a standalone HMI, rather. So as with standalone HMI devices, security solutions incorporated in the system vary between HMI manufacturers. A remote access security conclusion. A controls engineer really needs to consider the type of access that's required and needs to work closely with the owners and network administrator to ensure the proper devices, software, security, and functionality is achieved. And really this starts at the beginning of the project with whatever, whoever your design engineer is, um, making sure that they're specifying what's required. And then when it comes to the execution, the controls engineer has included some of those things that they need. It's in the execution phase, it's often a collaborative effort between the owner's information IT group and the controls contractor. They're often their group of um, IT people are often referred to as MIT, or Manufacturing Information Technology Group. Computer and network devices should be kept up to date on latest security patches. Again, the days of set and forget are over. The control systems integrator needs to be involved with control system updates. Do not let IT staff update control-related control computers or equipment without consulting a controls engineer. This could result in significant control system downtime. And a lot of times when you have computers that are running control software, a lot of times the Windows, automatic Windows updates will need to be turned off. And the reason for that is, you know, Windows likes to come out with updates and patches, and it takes time for the control system manufacturer to test their, how their software will react with those patches. 
And so usually the there's a, a lag there. Let's that could be three to six months or more before the your control system has been able to test their system with a new patch. And and I've seen it before where a Windows update was done by a mistake, and then the control system, as far as from a viewing standpoint, went down and was not able to view, and things had to quickly be reverted back just so that they could see what was going on um, through their operator interface. So cybersecurity, no internet. Am I safe from the big bad wolf if my control system is not connected to the internet? And the short answer is no. Remember Stuxnet worm discovered in 2010 that was used to cripple Iran's nuclear program? So there was a thumb drive that was supposedly left somewhere in their facility and somebody plugged it in and that was able to infect their system. So most operations have some type of electronic controller which has some means of connection. So serial port, USB, Ethernet, SD card, something of that nature. So even if you're not directly connected to the internet, you likely have some connection where somebody could plug something in. So in conclusion, the internet is a great tool that helps maintain and operate industrial systems. The role of the internet in industrial operations is expected to expand and has great potential to improve operations in the future. So like we talked about, there's no way to prevent every threat, but you can help mitigate risk for your system. And mitigation requires consistent attention. We recommend partnering with a qualified control system integrator and IT administrator to maintain your control systems and business networks on a regular basis. Now, setting and forgetting is no longer possible. Cybersecurity threats continually evolve, and risk mitigation therefore requires intentional ongoing efforts to maintain and protect your assets. So with that, that, that concludes the the controls portion. So thank you for your time on that. And before we continue on to the next session, we'll see if we have any questions here. It's like we're moving no. good, chat. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. And right. yep. It doesn't look like we have any questions, so I'll pass the torch off to the next presenter. All right, let me see if I can get my screen sharing up. All right, you guys seeing my screen? Yep. Does it look all right, Emily? Oh, we'll need to switch the display settings. That better? Yep. You got it. Okay. All right. Um, Emily, do you want to start her up? Sure. I can do that. Last presentation of the morning here. We are going to be talking about reverse osmosis or RO systems, um, including some additional technologies available within RO, such as closed circuit RO. And then, probably most importantly, talking about some of the operational challenges and benefits. So if we head to our next slide, we'll introduce our presenters. My name is Emily Meerdink. I've been with ISG not quite a year yet, and I'm up in one of our Minnesota offices. And then Kelly Evans, who you heard from earlier this morning, is a water wastewater engineer in our Des Moines office and also a licensed operator. And then last, but certainly not least, Tom Ford is going to be sharing more of the operational side of things, and he works for Prestige Foods of Iowa. All right, so getting into the presentation, what is reverse osmosis? Very simply put, it is a water treatment process that uses a high pressure pump and it pushes water through a semi-permeable RO membrane. And so the water molecules flow through this membrane and any contaminants are captured and rejected. So we can see on this diagram here at the bottom, we have our feed water, our pump, 
that water is being pushed through our membranes. And so our treated effluent is typically called our permeate water. And then anything that is rejected or cannot pass through this membranes is concentrated in our RO reject, or also sometimes just called concentrate. Here we have a nice yeah, clip. Let me go back, Emily. OK. <laughs> See if I can figure that one out. Kelly's going to be pulling up a nice video that's going to show us how water actually flows through these membranes. Oh, Kelly, we can't hear the sound for the video. Uh, Eric, you want to help me on that one? Here, let me just put the speaker over here. Reverse osmosis works by forcing water through a special plastic membrane sheet to remove compounds such as salt, organic compounds, microorganisms, viruses, and pharmaceuticals. Rolls of membrane sheets are wound into cylinder-shaped elements. There are several elements inside each long pressure vessel. As water enters the vessel, it flows over the membrane surface as it moves from one end of the vessel to the other. The membrane layer is extremely thin. It allows water to pass through or permeate, while preventing other compounds from passing through. Membranes remove molecules based on their size, shape, and charge. Generally, contaminants larger than water molecules will not pass through, including most chemical contaminants and all microorganisms such as viruses and bacteria. Two streams of water are produced. Pure, clean water or permeate flows across the membrane sheets and passes through the membrane layers to the inside pore tube. Water that does not permeate becomes more highly concentrated with salts and other substances. This water is called concentrate. The pure permeate water flows out the pore tube and one end of the pressure vessel, and the concentrate water flows out another outlet. The concentrate water can then flow into other pressure vessels for the same process to happen again, so even more pure permeate water can be recovered. About 82% of all the source of water becomes purified water. All right, Emily, did you guys catch all that? It was pretty quiet, but I could hear it. Okay. Go ahead. So we'll do a brief overview of what the clip kind of ran through. So as you can see, here is a picture of an RO membrane with all the layers peeled back. And as they mentioned, some of these membranes can be as thin as one millimeter. So these are very sensitive, very picky, and it rejects the contaminants typically based on the size of the particle, but it can also be based on the charge and things like that. Next slide. So, brief review of the vocab, just so we're all on the same page. Our treated water is called our permeate, so that is the clean water, if you will. Our RO reject, or concentrate, is everything that cannot pass through the filter. Um, and I don't know if we've mentioned this one yet, but our percent recovery. Um, obviously, not all the water that goes through the membrane goes into the clean water. And so that percent recovery is how much of the total water pumped we can capture. So what does reverse osmosis actually remove? So we can see on that bottom chart where conventional particle filtration is, this is what we think of for a typical sand and anthracite filter. And then we can see way off to the left where reverse osmosis falls in the scheme of things. So reverse osmosis can be a great tool for meeting certain MCLs. 
certain contaminants that are very difficult to remove otherwise, such as mercury, arsenic, if there's radium in the raw water, barium or chloride. It can also be used to remove other things such as hardness, so your calcium and magnesium, and then if you have additional polishing for iron or manganese removal. As mentioned, these RO membranes are very sensitive. So typically, and it depends on what kind of raw water quality you have, but typically they do require some sort of pretreatment. So you typically feed an antiscalant, which is some sort of chemical feed that prevents your calcium and magnesium from precipitating out. And then typically there's also some sort of filtration system. So be it green sand or oxidation and filtration to remove your iron, manganese, and TDS. And this really helps increase the membrane life and prevents fouling, which will obviously improve any operations as well. So there are several ways that you can set up an RO system. And we can see the one stage system at the top. It's as simple as it gets. Water comes in, goes to the RO membrane, our permeate leaves, our concentrate gets rejected. A two-stage system takes that concentrate and passes it through one more RO membrane to try to increase your percent recovery, so to increase how much permeate we are getting out of the system. Um, Sometimes you can't meet the required treatment with just one RO system. And so if you have a double pass system, your permeate goes through not just one RO, but two RO systems, just to get one more step in that final polishing. The schematic at the bottom actually shows a double pass, double stage system. because so not only is the permeate being treated twice, the concentrate is also going through another RO membrane. Um, I believe next Kelly Evans is going to tell us about another aspect of RO treatment and closed circuit RO. Thanks, Emily. Um, closed circuit RO um, is not really new technology, um, but you just don't see it much in drinking water applications throughout the state of Iowa. What it does is it recycles concentrate to improve percent recovery. So it's a semi-batch treatment. Basically what they strive to do is um, increase the percent recovery with their system. They, instead of just rejecting the concentrate water right down the drain, they continue to recycle it back around into the feed water so that anytime there is a dump to the drain itself, it's a batch system that gets dumped after that concentrated water has been recycled through several times and it's so concentrated that then it's time to dump it to continue the process. They um, promote upwards of 98% total recovery, um, but a pilot would definitely be required in a drinking water system to see what your system and your well water quality can produce for a final percent recovery. So closed circuit RO is basically a single stage system like what Emily showed before. Um, and it just concentrates the water over time to achieve that highest possible recovery. Whereas you need multiple stages in typical reverse osmosis to achieve the same percent recovery. Um, flexibility wise, you can self adjust in seconds on the closed circuit RO, whereas the Conventional RO is just kind of more, um, well, snapshot in time is the best way to put it. It's just accommodating variations in feed water quality it takes a lot of issues, whereas the closed circuit RO is built to continue to get changing in feed water quality as that concentrate gets highly and high, higher and higher concentrated as it keeps getting recirculated through. So closed circuit RO is more built for changes in water quality changes as the raw changes which is more applicable to, um, for instance, if you have two wells that are changing in quality or anything like that. So, um, Scaling and biofouling, um, 
closed circuit RO is widely varying ranges of selenium pressure over the course. I mean, it's used to that with getting that change in its reject water consistently being brought back through, whereas multi-stage reverse osmosis is not. Cleaning frequency, um, closed circuit RO promotes that it's given the decreased biofouling and scaling. Um, cleaning frequency is decreased by up to 83%. So if you're familiar with reverse osmosis, a CIP, which is a clean in place system, you um, have to do that to your RO system to increase efficiency every so often, and that can be anywhere between every six months to every five years to quote unquote never. It's just depending on the raw water quality, how you operate your system and everything else. In addition, um, closed circuit RO promotes that it has um, increased the membrane life um, to as little as one sixth of the multi stage RO. Um, simplicity wise, uh, since it's already built to take changing varied water qualities as it comes in, as that concentrate keeps getting recycled through, um, it's fairly simple to, to adjust it as things change in your system. And it's very efficient because if you can decrease your RO reject water to about 2% from the typical 20%. It's a great savings as far as for those towns who have limited capacity in their wastewater collection system or their wastewater treatment system. We have one community that just did a wastewater treatment plan upgrade. Now we're looking at doing a new water plant form. So they're concerned about, are we already gonna put our new wastewater system um, at its peak capacity due to these increased reject volumes that we're gonna get. So we're also looking at closed circuit RO. Granted, you can, on RO systems, continue with different stages. Instead of doing two stages, do three stages, do four. Um, but you should work with your engineer to discuss the cost implications of each option, whereas a closed circuit RO in and of itself comes pretty expensive because it's a newer technology. Um, but if you want to compete with the present reject, you have to go to multiple stages on a reverse osmosis system, and those additional stages start to cost more money as well, too. So weighing what your goals are for each project if you're going to do reverse osmosis will come in handy and have your engineer review those costs with you. Here's a case study in Padre Dam. Um, I'll just read this real quick to you, but they completed a nine-month pilot study to evaluate closed circuit RO. Um, the goal of the study was to just demonstrate the maximum achievable recovery. They're just trying to get that percent reject down. Um, Basically, what they came down to um, exceeded the CIP frequency of 30 days and was then operated all the way up to 97.5% recovery. Uh, your typical two-stage RO will get anywhere between 75 to 80% recovery, where closed circuit RO is touting up to 98% recovery. That's a large volume of water um, for anybody who's already looking at or already operating our RO system or is looking at 18% change in percent recovery is huge. Here's the case study on their percent recovery and where they got up to 97.5%. So conventional RO, like I said, is about 80% typical recovery. How you can think of this is the first stage will get 50% water recovery. So on your second stage, you'll get 50% of that remaining 50% concentrate recovered, which gets you up to 75%. Typically with efficiencies, that 75% can round up to about 80% typical recovery. So if you had a third stage RO, then you'd be upwards of 90%. Um, typically it's lesser cost, depending on how many stages you go with. There's more chemicals used in conventional RO, and it's more it's energy intensive, but on closed circuit RO, it's less energy intensive there's less chemicals used, but the capital cost in and of itself is more expensive, but you're achieving a higher percent recovery. So weighing your percent recoveries and your O&M costs throughout the project is very important for you and your engineer to review and making your decisions. Your engineer, your engineer should work with you to discuss your priorities to choose your best option. Um, yeah. Definitely look at O&M costs when looking at conventional RO versus closed circuit. Review reject volumes if that's a concern for your community and what you have for wastewater capacity. And then also look at your supply volumes too. If your supply is limiting you, closed circuit may be the best way to go so that you're not rejecting as much water and still producing as much supply as you can.
with not with conventional RO and closed circuit RO, 90 day piloting is required for any drinking water systems. Um, it's required when you're trying to remove an MCL from your wa raw water. Um, it's required when you have a new water source. It's required when you're utilizing SRF funding and it's a closed circuit RO. So if you're doing a closed circuit RO, it's required as well. It is not required um, for softening, for just basic softening, or just to achieve a higher water quality. Even if it's not required, a short-term pilot is still recommended, even if it's not required for design considerations. We have several communities that are looking at doing this without a pilot. Um, we're still having them do a two-week to four-week pilot just to do con design considerations and what worked best on pretreatment, etc. Industrial applications for reverse osmosis and closed circuit RO, um, food and beverage industry, um, particularly like breweries, wineries, they have very strict water quality requirements that they need for their system. Um, cosmetics, obviously pharmaceutical production for very clean water there. Seawater desalination and wastewater reuse. Municipal applications, chloride compliance is a big one um, and I'll go into that a little bit more but a lot of communities use ion exchange for softening um, and now they are getting chloride compliance schedules set on them and their MPDS permits on the wastewater side. Um, so replacing your ion exchange system to comply with your chloride compliance and going to RO is one. Softening, overall higher water quality, wastewater reuse and seawater desalination on the municipal side as well. So chloride compliance, I'm going to share a quick video again real quick, um, just showing how much this is becoming in uh, typical news. to learn a thing or two. Our own Ryan Silver learned about our water here in Minnesota being affected by softener salt we use every day. Here in Minnesota, soft water is hard to find. This map indicates most of the state has hard water. This means more softener salt is needed to treat the water. There's one large salty problem with this. The more softer salt you use, the more chloride that gets into our rivers, lakes, and streams. This can be detrimental, killing aquatic life and making our water unhealthy. To remove that chloride is an extremely expensive uh, technology. So that's a problem for most cities. They can't afford that kind of treatment. Chloride doesn't dissolve. Once it's there, it's there forever. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency identified that this was a major problem just over a decade ago. Ever since, they have been trying to educate citizens about how much softer salt or melting salt is good to use. Being on your sidewalk at home, it, it's kind of alarming. A space that would be like a normal size of a parking space in a parking lot really needs only one cup of salt spread throughout, and that will melt as much as if you you know, layer it thick like you're putting peanut butter on bread. This is it that featured a new water softener and the benefits it brings compared to an old one. Mickelson understands that replacing a water softener isn't cheap, but the savings in the long run, as well as helping our area waterways, is well worth it. If you have an old system, maybe it's time to upgrade because the newer systems run, uh, the old ones would run on a timer. So every day at the same time or every other day, it cycles through. The newer technologies are on a uh, use base. So when it needs to recycle, it will. Mickelson added that other major chloride pollutants in the state include using way too much road salt in the water, as well as runoff from agriculture. At the Minnesota State Fair, Ryan Schobert, KEYC News 12. So, Basically, I'm not trying to say that reverse osmosis is the end-all, be-all cure for this, um, but you're starting to see chlorides become a bigger issue, and we're looking in, we're looking into different ways to. Um, uh, there's multiple ways to address the chloride issues, and reverse osmosis being one of them. But we have several communities that have us looking into these options, um, and and reverse osmosis is just one of those ways to do it. Um, you can see that the chloride compliance schedules are starting to come out into MPDS permits. Um, here's an example of one that we're working with on a community right now. 
And here's several different options to look at for chloride compliance strategies, source reduction being the one that's typically the best way to go and attack uh, chloride issues is at the source itself. Um, so looking at reducing your amount of salt you use in the water plant or switching treatment methods all in general to a reverse osmosis. There's also recycle reuse, site specific limits and others. Your engineer can work with you on different options that would work best for your community or industry. So now we got Tom Ford. He's with Prestige Foods of Iowa. He's an operator of a system that ISG designed. Um, his system is a 1.4 MGD plant. It's scalable up to 2.8 MGD. He has two Jordan Aquifer wells, chlorine addition for ammonia, iron, and manganese removal, two 875 gallon per minute pressure filters, anti-scalant and sodium bisulfide addition, then two 625 gallon per minute reverse osmosis skids, polyphosphate addition, and chlorine addition. Tom, can you, can we hear you? Tom, are you on? Eric, do you want to check if Tom can talk right now? Okay, um, we might have to go on without Tom. Um, Difficulty of operations. Tom came from a system that really had no treatment whatsoever when he came over to Prestige Foods of Iowa. Um, so he jumped right in feet first into a grade three system, um, mostly due to volume, but also the complexity of his operation system. Um, personal thoughts that we've kind of discussed with him, he didn't find it that difficult. And I wish he could be here to say this. Um, I don't know what's going on with our audio right now, but um, I wish he could be here to say this, but he didn't find a lot of issues. Um, EB, just an FYI, Tom just texted me and says I'm here, but just can't, we can't hear him. So I don't know if he can check something with his audio, um, but I'll continue on. He didn't find a lot of issues with the operations of the system. Again, he came from a system that didn't do anything with RO, any treatment whatsoever besides chlorine addition. And um, he came in, the manufacturer of the RO system also came in, obviously, and provided training um, as part of their contract that we always set up in our designs. And, you know, he jumped feet first right in and didn't have a lot of issues. He is a grade three system at his plant, but that was mostly due to their flows. You are going to, uh, for a lot of small towns, they get concerned about going to reverse osmosis system. Anything under 0 0.5 million gallons per day is still a grade two system on RO. Um, so that's something to consider, too, where you don't have to upgrade your, your grade classification to go to a reverse osmosis system. High pressure system, um, Tom would tell you he's had a few issues with this. RO operates on a very high pressure system. Um, so if you have a valve that sticks and you notice that it's sticking closed and you have pressure getting pushed up against it, don't go turn that valve right away and just release that water because that's uh, what calls a water hammer and blew apart some of our piping there early on in the startup of this system. Varying raw water qualities. Um, Tom has two Jordan Aquifer wells there, but each one's a little bit different in its water quality, even though they're only about a thousand feet apart. Uh, one has a little bit higher iron and manganese in it. So when Tom has to switch over to um, one or the other one of his wells, he has to adjust his chlorine feed to break all the iron and manganese through the filter before it hits his RO system. So that's one of the challenges that really comes with this is just your raw water quality. But if your water water, water raw water quality stays consistent, um, between all your sources, then that's usually not an issue. Really, the biggest issue is just looking at your operational grades. Again, if you're under 0 0.5 MGD, you stay at a grade two. And then just any other options as far as high pressure systems or stuff like that, just be cautious of that, conscious of it. It's all the issue there is there. It's nothing to be feared. <sighs> Items to keep in mind during design. Um, again, I wish Tom was on here on this. Um, I know he can hear me, so he's probably just smiling, but. A um, few of the things to keep in mind during design, I, coming from the engineering side, I guess I don't know if I can really t speak to that too much as far as for your operators, but work with your engineer to as far as valving, if there's specific uh, manufacturer valves that you require or, you know, sampling locations throughout, uh, especially for Prestige Foods, 
He has sampling locations throughout his plant. Um, just working with your engineer to make sure the ease of that is set up in the design um, and that controls are user friendly and everything else. Operational benefits. Prestige system on a few of their lines required zero grains per gallon hardness, um, specifically to their boilers and everything. So RO got it down to that one grain per gallon, but we had it. We added a um, softener after that RO system for the very small flow that the boilers required um, to finish getting it down to that zero grains per gallon. But RO allows you to achieve strict water quality requirements throughout any system that you need. Um, typically what you do, and a lot of communities don't realize this as well, is that RO will bring it down so soft and remove so, so many contaminants within the water that you usually bring a blend water back through. So let's say you're producing 800 gallons per minute, but you only send 400 gallons per minute through the RO. Well, and if you have an 80% recovery, you're down to what, maybe 100 gallons per minute of reject. So it's not 20% um, of the total 800 gallons, it's only 20% reject of what actually goes to the reverse osmosis system. Um, another operational benefit, like I discussed before, was chloride reduction for softening. Um, it's also very, you can scale it for, if it, you're a growing community or anything like that, you can easily allow for uh, additional RO skids, pre-filters, anything like that. And then ease of operations. Um, again, if Tom was on, I think he would state, and I even helped during the piloting and everything, the operations were pretty easy. There's nothing to be scared of there. I was going to ask Tom some questions of what he would have done differently um, if he was involved during the design. He wasn't brought on until um, design was already done. I think it was in construction, so Tom kind of got thrown in uh, in the middle of everything. Um, training on the RO system, I was there for some of the training when Wigan provided that. I was there during a lot of the startups and everything. Um, just make sure you're an engineer has in the specs that the manufacturer has to provide so many days worth of training work with your engineer too to state how many days those are and everything else um, it's very important to get that training from the manufacturer themselves because each ro skid um, each manufacturer has a little bit different techniques on different things for operations um, training of his new operators i know was a little difficult too because he did he had to bring in a few operators that didn't have a lot of experience in the water wastewater field yet just being a new facility and starting up um, so i know he had a few issues but again it's more or less teaching people not to be afraid or not to fear ro but to just respect it and know what it can and can't do and then it can be very user friendly from there going forward once you understand that That's all we have for this presentation. Um, I'd like to thank you guys. If there's any questions, Emily, if you want to read them to me because I can't see the screen with the questions that pop up, if there are any. Um, Tom, I know you can hear me at least, but um, <laughs> thanks for calling in and trying on that. But, um, appreciate it, and if there's any questions, I can take those now. So we don't Am I able to be here now? Hey, Tom, we can hear you now. All right, all right. here from both places right. here. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Mute your, okay. Sorry mute about that. Computer. Um, but yeah, so yep. Tom, do you want to speak to what you would have done differently if your RO system, if you were involved in the beginning of design? Uh, yes, uh, there are a few things. I mean, uh, with the uh, pneumatic valves were kind of an issue, as you mentioned on the uh, earlier. Um, not too much I would have changed uh, from programming wise. I mean, that was a rocky road at the beginning. Uh, it took about four months to kind of iron everything completely out to have uh, you know, a normal operation and be able to have that full night of sleep. Um, I, uh, one major thing would be the, uh, the Schedule 80 PVC piping. I would rather prefer to see ductile iron, uh, just the more stability-wise, and, uh, of course, you mentioned the overpressurization and blowing up pipes. Uh, I think, uh, you know, more PRVs, uh, different locations uh, before and after, I think would have been beneficial just uh, to uh, prevent from overpressurization and causing damage. Uh, but from changing much, I think uh, ISG did a pretty good job. 
Okay, yep, and the Schedule 80 PVC, and I'll hit on that in just general treatment terms. Um, you'll see a lot of treatment plants anymore going into Schedule 80 PVC. It's more or less a cost savings, and that kind of what it was on Prestige Foods was a cost savings option. Um, ductile iron, though, is still the tried and true as far as just a lot more strength in the system. Um, Schedule 80 PVC was only installed at Prestige where there was pressures that were, um, you know, 80 PSI and under. Unfortunately, when a valve sticks and then holds back pressure and everything, a water hammer is where that ductile iron definitely would have held in a lot better because I know, Tom, you called me at 4.30 on a Thursday one week when we blew a piping <laughs> apart one time, and then you did it the exact same day the following week at 4.30 when everything was closing. So, yeah, I wish we would have stick with the uh, ductile iron there too, especially those two weeks. So, um, How did training of the RO system go for you, Tom? Uh, relatively pretty easy. I just uh, stuck pretty close with Wigan, asked all the questions I could possibly think of. And as you said earlier, just don't be scared. Just get right in there uh, and just be willing to learn. It'll come pretty naturally. Uh, you know, at this point, you know, being in operation for a year and a half, I mean, it's pretty uh, hands-off. It's just uh, your normal PMs and uh, making sure everything's reading true, keeping everything calibrated, and it's a pretty easy ride. Because you came from a plant that really didn't have much for treatment before Prestige, right, Tom? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, we were a uh, pretty plain Jane. I have a... Uh, uh, just for everybody who uh, that may not know me, I uh, never work for a municipality. I just do industrial plants uh, for you know, slaughterhouses. So uh, the last place I was at, we would just pull out of the Jordanian aquifer, uh, add a polyphosphate, chlorine for disinfection, and uh, hit uh, went through 20 micron sock filters, and that was it. Yeah, and you didn't find much issues with jumping into this and learning how to go forward on this? Not at all. I uh, I kind of like the challenge. Anything else you want to add, Tom? Uh, no, no, it's pretty good. Uh, the presentation was great. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Tom, for being on. And everybody, thank you for joining. Uh, Julie's going to wrap up the session. Unless there's any questions I missed, Julie's going to wrap up the session, and then we'll work on CEUs after that. Okay, I'm back. Thank you, Kelly and everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we appreciate the attendance. Hopefully this was useful for you um, learning-wise in addition to getting CUs. Again, if you did not put a name in when you logged in and just gave us a phone number, please email us with who, what phone number you're attached with so we have that for attendance. Also, if there's more than one of you at a site, more than one operator at a site, could you please um, list who all is at that site and their operator number? A number of you have done that. We appreciate that. Um, but if you have not done that and you have more than one person, please do that. So you will get an email from us um, yet this week that is your what we would normally refer to as your pink copy of your CU form. That uh, email is your confirmation that you attended and that you earned CEUs. Please print that for your records. That will also be uh, submitted. A spreadsheet will be submitted to the Iowa DNR, and these CEUs will show up in the operator certification database. In addition, we are doing wastewater training next Tuesday morning. The invitation for that went out this morning. So if you are uh, looking for wastewater CUs or know someone who is, uh, please look for that. If you did not get it, it will go out on Facebook and LinkedIn um, the end of this week, I believe. Um, also, you will be getting a survey um, looking for feedback from you about how this worked for you. Um, other topics, this is something that ISG hopes to provide regularly. We will see um, what the availability is to continue to provide CUs for these types of training. Um, I know Lori Sharp and the DNR are reviewing options and looking at ways to for you to um, achieve and obtain CUs during this time of uh, distancing and how that might work as we come out of this COVID event. So again, thank you for attending. 
Thank you very much for the work that you're doing and everybody be safe. Thank you.